Okay, three, two, one. Hello world! This is Anthony and you're watching lesson number 16, if I remember correctly, of the Inglorious Academy in which we teach JavaScript and web technologies for free for everybody. Um, so this lesson will start as a reprise of uh, functions because I saw that you had a few problems with them. Um, no worries, we're not slowing down. Uh, actually, I condensed uh, more than one topic together. So uh, what I wanted to show you is this. Functions are a part of the JavaScript fundamentals, which we are still doing since the age of time. But if you look at all the slides, there's already another set of slides called JS functions, which is the number 15. And in the part about functions, um, we talk about recursion, which we haven't covered yet, but we could. Um, we covered closures, which is something that you already know almost, because it's all about hiding um, functions and variables inside of a function. So um, we already saw a little bit about this. And there's also a part about hoisting, which we already know and avoiding globals. So as you can see, the few slides that we have here in JS functions, lesson number, well, it, slides number 15, are already almost covered all of them. So don't worry because we're, we're already at a good point. So no worries at all. Hi Angelo, good morning, good morning. I see seven viewers on the app, but it probably the number of viewers uh, is Quite, quite different. Oh, there's also Bobby. Hi, morning. And here I see some other users that usually do not interact with us. Lemon Juice is 12, Rubber Slayer. I see Tiago, and we've got Twitch details, which I have no idea who that is. Uh, we reached 230 followers. I think that's a good goal. Um, I saw the number increasing and maybe decreasing by one, and now it increased by two dramatically. Hey, we've got Tiago, we've got Sao, awesome. So we've got all the interacting bunch. And also the lurkers. Hi, lurkers! So nice to see you here too. It's so nice to see how many people watch these streams. It's always usually uh, a mean of uh, an average of 130 people, um, which is awesome. Thanks a lot for sticking with, with us. I would love to also see you interact with us too, but uh, it's fine if it's fine if you just want to watch and uh, do not interact. You're not forced to. Uh, but the good thing about this course, the real advantage of this course, is interactivity. In fact, lots of you give me your exercises, your opinions, and I take care of those opinions. Uh, today we started with uh, with um, a poll <laughs> in which I asked you. Uh, what do you want me to do tomorrow? Um, two people asked to pause and still do something about functions. Uh, I put my vote too. I wanted to move forward, but that's fine if you want to stay a little bit. In fact, uh, I have one thing, one more exercise that I would like to show you about functions. So let's do this. Zero one functions reprise. I already created my folder and I already created my file. If you want to, just do it too, and then we can start. So, as the notification should have alerted you, today we are going to create our first uh, JavaScript framework, which is not really true. Um, it's not a JavaScript framework, but we're going to write probably some code that reminds a little bit of uh, Facebook's React framework, which is one of the main three JavaScript frameworks out there. There's Google's Angular, there's uh, Facebook's mm, React, and then there's Vue.js, which is, I, I would say, it's independent. It doesn't, it's not backed by one company per se, if I remember correctly. So, we're doing some functions, and I saw that you had uh, some issues in understanding the inputs and outputs of functions. How, I, how can I use the output of a function and use it somewhere else? So that's what we are going to do. Let's focus on this thing in particular. And if you have other questions, other dubs, you can ask me. I'll try to go slow, 
And I hope still that this will, will not be the four hours. I hope that we will be able also to move forward today. We can practice in the first two hours maybe and then move on. Yeah, okay, yeah, sure. One hour, two hour, and then we move on. Why not? That's awesome. Okay, so um, I would like to have um, a few functions that take a string and uh, change it somehow. Uh, I will show you one thing that you never saw before, uh, a way to change the string and make it all uppercase. And uh, everything else will be pretty similar to what we, you, we already know, which is template literals, template strings. So, I want to create a function that takes some text and shouts it. And to shout means to have everything uppercase. So, I'm going to create a function. Function shout given some string, and I think that I have to call it str and not string, because string could be a reserved keyword. It shouldn't be, but just to be sure, I will call it str. And this is a function that takes a string as an input and will give something as an output. What can I give as an output? Well, I can create a variable here or a constant called shouted str. And shouted str is the result of performing this operation, which you don't know yet. So I'm going to show it to you for the first time. I'm asking str to do something. So str dot do something. And this do th something is to upper case with parentheses and a semicolon. So it looks like I'm invoking a function but I'm invoking a function on some, well, I'll tell you, on some object, which is pretty much the same thing that we already saw for, for example, math.round or math. Uh, what did we say? Math.floor. Okay? So these are special functions because they are functions that belong to someone who we can ask something, uh, we can ask the string to, to, to perform some operation for us. But still, it's a function, okay? So, function shout, given the string, is going to take the string and with invoking this function called to uppercase, this is going to return a new string which has all the letters in uppercase. And I'm storing the result of this operation into some variable, some constant. And now, if I want this result to be available outside of this function, I can just return the value that I have. If I return, this means that I want to expose to the, outs to the external world of this function some value. And in this case, I want to expose this value in particular. So, as you can see, the function, as always, um, behaves like a black box that accepts some inputs and then performs some calculations, and then decides to expose, to give in return, some output. And in this case, after all the calculations, which is just a stupid calculation, just one line of code, we are outputting, we are returning the final result. We can do some more calculations here in between, we can declare variables and invoke some other functions, but at the end of the day, at the end of this function, we are still going to output just one thing, which is usually the result of all of our, of all our calculations. So let's try this function. I'm going to invoke the function before declaring it because I can. Because function declarations are subject to hoisting, which means that even, in, even though I write them at the bottom of the file, they are interpreted by, Java, just the, yeah, by the JavaScript interpreter as they were declared on the top of the file. Bobby says, can't you just declare the string and then console log string to uppercase? Yes, I can. But as you will see, I will be able to use this shout function as I please. I can console log. Let's do this. Console.log shouted string. Is this what you want? Probably. Or maybe I can even do this on one line, which is instead of even declaring the variable, I can do console log of str to uppercase. And that's it. Yes, I can. 
I can and I will. Okay, let's try. Let's start like this. So now I want to invoke this function. So shout. Oh come on, shout um, with uh, the string hello world. As you can see, this this string has has a capital letter and has lowercase letters. I want them to be all uppercase. No, skipping the whole function. Oh, okay, yeah. I could even just console log everything. So instead of using a function, just comment it out. I can do console log of uh, hello world dot to uppercase. Could work. In fact, it does work. So in here, I'm not even declaring a variable. This is the the, the shortest form of my function. It's not a function even. I'm just declaring. Uh, I'm just uh, yeah. I'm declaring a string, but it's not even a variable. And then I'm asking the same string to perform uppercase. And whatever it's done, it's console locked. This is an example that is not avoiding functions. In fact, we already have two functions here. One function is to uppercase, which is not properly a function. I could, I could call it a method, but don't worry about that. It's a function. It's a function that I'm applying on this string. So I'm already invoking this function. And luckily, to uppercase is not printing the string. It's returning the string so I can use it in some place. How can I use this string? Well, for example, I can console log it, which is another function. This is a function that belongs to the object called console. So as you can see, the function to uppercase knows how to take a string and return the uppercase version, regardless of where I'm using or why I'm using this function. And the same goes with console log. Console log is so generic that it can accept any parameter, even any number of parameters, and it's still going to print those parameters. These are functions and their power is to be so generic that I can use them in any situation. The line of code that I wrote is not as generic. This line of code is just going to do exactly this thing. It's going to just print hello world, it's going to, to make it uppercase, and it's going to print it. But, for example, I cannot change the string, un unless, of course, I, I change the script. But I don't want to change the script. I want to uh, make this thing as dynamic as possible. Maybe I want the string to be uh, taken from the user, for example. And this is not allowing me to change any of the behavior. I would like the behavior to be as generic as possible so I can reuse this behavior in multiple occasions. Uh, this code is rigid and we want to make it a little more flexible. But still, it works and I'm going to prove that it works. I'm going to open the integrate terminal. Uh, but not like this. <laughs> I'm going to in open the integrated terminal on this file. So cl right click on that file, open an integrated terminal, and now I'm exactly where I want to be. So let's uh, make this terminal a little bigger. And now I'm going to say node of 01 functions reprise. Hello world, oh uppercase. This is nice, but what if I want to now I don't know, uh, I want to console log another string to uppercase. Um, let's say I want to console log did you get it to uppercase. I can. Did you get it to uppercase? Let's see what happens. Yay, I've got hello world and then did you get it all uppercase. But as you can see uh, the code is starting to be subject to some duplication. Um, the only thing that changes here between these two lines is the string. But all the rest is exactly the same. I'm asking to do to uppercase and I'm doing console log to both. And uh, if I do another one, then let's move on. But uh, probably I have to escape this one here uh, to uppercase. Okay, 
So I do this. Hello world. Did you get it? Then let's move on. As you can see, I've got three lines of code and they are almost exactly the same. I'm just changing the string. And I don't want to have this kind of code, which is just a copy and paste, rinse and repeat every single time. We already saw that loops, for example, are really, really good to avoid this kind of duplication in, in order to uh, avoid asking you the same thing over and over again uh, or, or ex executing the same stuff over and over again. It will just do it by itself. So functions actually do a similar thing here. You can declare a function like this one, shout str, which is going to do exactly the same thing that we have in these three lines, but at least it is parameterized uh, in terms of the string. Now we can console log string to uppercase regardless of the string that we want to print. If we declare such a function, then these three lines of code become something like this. Shout hello world, and then shout did you get it? And then shout then let's move on. These three lines of code are exactly the same as these three lines, but as you can see, the, num the number of things that I had to re replicate is reduced to the minimum because the only thing that is replicated here is the name of the function. So probably right now you're already able to understand how a function can allow you to just reduce duplication. This is ugly, it's difficult to read, and it is also difficult to uh, it is also pretty easy to uh, mess up one word or uh, if I have to change the behavior on one line, I have to repeat the change of that behavior in all of the lines. A function encapsulates, so hides and generalizes some behavior. And if I want to change the behavior of the shout function, I just need to change it here and it will be applied to every single invocation of the same function. So, as you can see, this is, let's say, without functions, which is already completely false because we are using two functions here. Here we are using two uppercase, which is a function, and console log, which is a function. You can always tell that we're using a function if there is a verb with some uh, parentheses, uh, sometimes with no parameters inside, like in two uppercase, or sometimes with a parameter inside, such as in console log. Everything that you see that I highlighted here is the parameter of console log. So here we've got one function that does everything. Um, this is, well, with functions. And this function is, as you can see, uh, generalizing the input. Uh, you know what? I'm going to say this with function. Uh, I don't know, with um, parametric string as input. I don't know. Uh, let's say with function with input, because this is a function with an input, but it doesn't have an output. This function does nothing really. The only thing that it does is a side effect, and the side effect is printing something. But then, what happens if you want to do something else with the string? So now the, the, the exercise that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm proposing to you is this. I want to have a string, and then I want to have it shouted, so it will be str. And then I also want it yelled which means that the string will also have three exclamation marks. And then I also want it to be um, in a tag. So maybe an H1. Okay, this is what I want now. 
This is my challenge to you. Well, we are going to do this together, actually. And then you can, you can do some more exercises uh, based on this thing. So as you can see, this is more like a stream of data in which I start with a string and then I want to change it into a greater string. And then I want to change it a little more and then I want to change it some more. How do I do this? Yes, I can do everything in one, uh, in one go. So, for example, I can say str to uppercase, well, let's say hello world. So, hello world is to uppercase. And to uppercase will return a string, an, a shouted string, shouted str. And then I can take the shouted string and create a yelled string. The yelled string is the shouted string, but I have to also add a couple of exclamation marks. I'm forgetting the semicolon, so I'm going to put them. So I start with a string called hello world and I do an uppercase, so I get a shouted string. So I'm on this step here. Now with the shouted string, I'm going to add a couple of uh, uh, three exclamation marks and this is a yelled string. And now that I've got the yell string, I can wrap it into h1 tags. So it becomes, I don't know, an HTML string. Const HTML string is equal to, uh, we can use template literals, h1 and close h1. And in between, I'm going to interpolate the yelled string. Mm hmm. I know that I'm going fast, so I'm slowing and I'm stopping from time to time to give you the time to process what I'm saying and also to keep up with the, with the code. So, I'm transforming the original string, creating every time some new stuff. The smart ass among you could say, hey, I could do this in one string in one line of code. Yes, you can. In fact, I'm going to do it. You can do this in one line of code. You say hello world. And then you do two uppercase. And then whatever you have can be with a plus three exclamation marks. And then you can wrap everything as the expression inside of an h1 template literal. Just to be clear, you don't need to do this kind of uh, uh, concatenation. You can do a template literal here too. It's just to have some more variety. But if you want to, you can just have the three exclamation marks here and you just remove it from here. It is exactly the same thing. The result is exactly the same. So as you can see, in one line of code, I created exactly what I wanted. It will be an H1 with a hello world, with a hello world all shouted with three exclamation mark at the end. Yes, it works. And now I need also to probably console log it. Otherwise, I won't see anything. And here too, I'm going to console log the HTML string. So we will see that these two results are exactly the same. Hey, Marky, Marchi057, want to become famous, buy followers, primes, and viewers on... Oops, the link is not available, sorry. I'm going to moderate you, sorry for that. Ban user. Uh, because you're a spammer. But lots of love, spammer. I'm pretty sure that you're a bot and uh, not a real human being. So if you're a bot, lots of circuits. Um, okay, so we've got, um, now we will have some, some inputs because we will have hello world, blah, blah, blah. And we've got all these shouts and then we will have this thing here and then we'll have all these things here. So as always, if we want to focus on the same, on one piece of our, of our script, then we need to comment out everything. Or 
There's another thing that we can do, now that we know functions, we can wrap everything inside of a function. Um, I don't know, first try. And if we wrap everything inside of a function, now we declare the function that we can either decide to invoke or not invoke. If we are not invoking the function first try, then this means that this code will never be executed. So, yeah, another good uh, reason to use functions is because you can uh, mute your code without commenting every single line. You just wrap it into a function. And if you want this function to be executed, you just invoke it. First try, that's it. But if you don't want to invoke it, you comment out this single line of code and you get rid of all this code that is inside of it. Pretty cool. But I think that we never even tried these shouts, or did we? No, probably not. So you know what, I'm going to unmute first try. And instead, maybe I can change, I can wrap everything in second try as a function. And then I'm not going to execute this function second try. Okay, so just to be clear, I was doing a couple of exercises. The first one was this one that was using no functions and then it tried one function with an input uh, and no output. And we want to try this one. So I'm wrapping everything inside of a function and then I'm invoking the function so this code will be actually executed. The second part is an exercise that I was starting to create but now I want to mute it. So instead of just commenting out everything in the code, I'm wrapping it into a function and I'm not invoking the function. So it means that the function will not be executed. This code will never see the lights. So now if I'm invoking this first try function when I am uh, when I'm actually running the script, it will show me hello world did you get it now let's move on. Hello world did you get it then let's move on which is exactly three lines of code which are equal to the other ones. So this means that these three console log are actually exactly the same as these three shouts because shout just generalized one piece of this piece of code. The piece that was generalized is everything, well, except the string. You can pass any string and it will be turned to uppercase and it will be logged. This is what the shout function does. So I can then apply shout to any string and it will just work. Okay, so first try, good. Let's try with the second try. So I'm going to invoke second try. And I can see that when I'm executing second try, I will see hello world uh, all shouted all yelled which means in three with three exclamation marks and all wrapped inside of an h1 tag it shows in the first line and it shows in the second line exactly the same so this means that this console log statement is actually the same thing as these four statements that i have here so what is best is it tw line 24 the best line of code Probably not, because this is pretty difficult to understand. Well, this, although it's a little more verbose, well, it shows you exactly what are the steps that are being applied. So, shouted string is hello world to uppercase. And then yelled string is shouted string, but with the addition of the three exclamation marks, which we can do with the template literal if you want to. I don't know if you prefer template literals, but template literals but it's actually like this if you want to and then you can wrap everything inside of an h1 having an html string that you then finally console log as you can see here we are doing everything at the same on the same line one ex one whole execution this is actually a little more performant for the computer because it doesn't waste time in creating variables but who cares about what the computer says we don't care about the performance we don't care about premature optimization because that is the root of all evil 
any fool is able to write a program that a computer can understand, while only the brave are able to write a program that a human is able to understand. And I'm more keen to understand this four lines of code than this single line of code here. I can understand it, of course, I can. But the problem is that I need to, well, not now, but in a week, I will see this and I will try to say, oh, what is happening? So there's an H1, then there's an hello world, but this is to uppercase and it's being concatenated with a, this exclamation mark and then uh, an H1. But why did I do the uppercase? Well, this variable is telling me why, because I want the text to be shouted. Okay, so uppercase in my particular scenario here means that I want to shout this sentence. And what does it mean to have these three exclamation marks? Well, it means that I'm going to yell also. And why did I place everything in H1? Because I want this H to be an HTML string to put on a document rights um, or a console log. You know, uh, Bobby is fond of document rights, so you can just use document, oops, document dot write, which is another function. So I don't know why you don't like functions. You are using them. Console log. Okay, so this code is beautiful, but it depends on some things that are now sculpted and I cannot change them in any way. They are, as we say, hard-coded. They are hard-coded, so I cannot change them on the fly. For example, if I want to do this shouted all this thing, but I want to do it on a different string, not only hello world, I want to do it on something else, then I just I cannot just open the script every time I want to change the variable and uh, and apply it here. I can use some function like this one, and I'm going to add it here. I want to shout the string, and since I know how to shout a string, I can use this function. So now my s second attempt. So this is the let's say smart ass way. This is a cleaner approach. And now we're going to try another approach, which is with functions. Okay, I'm going to close this terminal for now so you can have a look at all the code. So the smartest way is to do everything in one line of code because I'm cool, I don't care about people understanding my code, my code is, is good, and if you don't understand my code, this means that you're not as smart as me. Or there's a cleaner approach in which I explain to anyone, especially myself in six months, what I was meaning with all this crap. And then we can do something with functions which is not only a cleaner approach, but it will also allow me to generalize, parameterize, and create some code that is much more powerful, because it will allow me to use some building blocks in multiple ways. Not just have this code here, but to enable multiple possibilities. So with functions, I can shout using the shout string. So Probably I can say something like shout the string hello world. Uh, and then once I shout at hello world, I want to yell it. And I can do something like function yell string. And function yell string, if I copy whatever I wrote here in shout, will be something like console log of string plus the three exclamation marks. Or, as always, I can use template literals if you want. So I want shout hello world, and then I want to yell whatever is after shout. And now you see the problem. If I shout hello world, this will print hello world shouted, and then I lose this value forever. I cannot take the value and use it in some other computation. And this is exactly what we've done here instead. Here we are invoking a function that will return a value, we store the value somewhere and we can reuse the value in some other expression or in some other function. So that's the reason why we need a return statement. I don't want to just print 
the shout of a string. I want to return whatever is computed from this function so I can reuse it somewhere else. So in the first try, I just needed to shout. But now I want to shout and also do other things. So that's why the shout with a return statement is much, much more powerful than just console log, whatever is the result of the computation inside of the string. In fact, if I return string to uppercase, then invoking this function shout will actually return me something that I can store in a variable. And now that I can store it in a variable, I can reuse this variable to do, it, to do something else with it, which is exactly the same thing that we've done so far without functions. In fact, the result of the expression will return something that I can store in a variable, and then I can reuse the variable for some other computations. This is exactly the same. The only thing that changes here is that this kind of expression is now somehow uh, encapsulated, is hidden inside of a black box. So this console log is not really useful because if I yell now, I can do yell the shouted string. I can yell the shouted string, but this, as the function says, will just console log the shouted string with some exclamation marks. But it's not over. I don't want to just console log the yelled string. I also want to wrap it into an HTML tag. So. I don't care about console logging in the function. I want to return whatever it is, the results of this calculation, so I can store it in some other variable and I can reuse it. So, as you can see, it is important to have input parameters so the operation can be applied to any kind of input that I want to pass, not just hello world, but any kind of string. And it's also important to have an output of the function because this way I can use and reuse the output of the function any way I please. Even more than what you're seeing right now. I'll show you. So now that we've got the yell string, we, can, we want to also wrap it into an HTML tag. And this can become a function too. Function, I don't know, HTML, given a string, any string, if I look at this expression, it means that I just want to get one string, whatever string it is, not even a yell string, it can be any string, and I want to wrap it in h1 tags. So now I know I have to return whatever is the result of a calculation, and the calculation is as easy as doing this kind of uh, interpolation in a template literal. I take a string, any string, and I wrap it in h1 tags, and I return the result of this computation. So now with functions, now we've got the HTML string, which is the result of HTMLing the yelled string. And finally, if this is the final thing that I want, I can do a console log of the HTML string. This is what I wanted. So I hope I'm not going too fast. Remember that sometimes you can just copy-paste bits of code if you don't want to write all the code by yourself. But the most important part is that you got the concept. The concept here is very, very easy, actually. We are just going to replace any expression that hard codes the input and the output with a more generic function that accepts any input and returns the output so it can be used in any way, not just to console log, but also to perform some other calculations, maybe. So let's open the terminal and see how these guys behave. Oh, shouted string has already been declared. Of course, I've got a problem because I'm reusing the same variables over and over again. This is a problem. So, without functions, I have to change the variable names. Shout it string one, yell string one, etc., etc. But with functions, I can leverage the power of functions to encapsulate, to hide, to close all these variables. And I can do something like function, let's call it cleaner approach. Because this is exactly what the comment says. I wrap everything inside of this function and I execute 
this function. And now I've got two advantages. One, these variables do not conflict with these other ones because these variables are local to the function and they just, they are born, they live and they die inside of this function. So I uh, encapsulated this function, I hid this, the, these, uh, these variables and I don't need to rename anything because these are completely separate declarations. First advantage. Second advantage, I don't even need this comment here because this comment is exactly saying what this, um, what, what this function says. So I can remove this comment. Of course, it's a cleaner approach. It's, it's said exactly in here. And I can do the same with here. Um, so I can just function, uh, let's say with functions, I can wrap everything like this. And I don't even need to do this. I can just invoke with functions. That's it. These functions, shout, yell, and HTML, could be also declared inside of this function just to make them private inside of that function. Or if I want to reuse them, uh, then I will just keep them outside. Whatever is outside of the function is available from inside the function. So shout is declared outside of the function, but I can use it inside of the function. But whatever I have inside of the function, for example, this variable shouted string, is not available outside. This is the phenomenon which in JavaScript is called closure. But it's a phenomenon that you see in every, um, in, in every programming language. It's the root of modularity in programming languages. Because you want, inside of these black boxes, to have everything be private. Unless you really want to expose it. So everything in the function shout will be private unless you want to return it. And in that case, only the return thing will be publicly accessible. So let's try this one. Oop. Ah, come on, clear. Okay, we've got three hello worlds which look exactly the same. And these three hello worlds are the smart ass way with no functions at all because I don't want to use hello. Uh, hey, Magic Ross, hello world. Hello to you, so nice to see you here. And we've got the cleaner approach, which is going to just uh, separate this whole uh, statement in multiple statements, and it already makes it a little more clear. Or we've got the approach with functions, which is going to use smarter functions that apply to some uh, parameter, but they also are able to return something that you can reuse in other functions. Actually, even with this function, this, uh, this function too can also be parametric and I can avoid hard coding hello world inside of this function. It's as easy as saying with function depends on a string and whatever strings comes, I will put it here. And this means that when I invoke with functions, I have to invoke it with some, uh, with some string. But now, with functions, this uh, stupid function that uses a lot of sub-functions and does so many calculations, I can reuse it how many times I want. You see, I can reuse the same thing over and over again and I don't need to repeat all the process of shouting, yelling, wrapping in HTML and then printing. I can just invoke one line of code called with functions. What is with functions? I don't know. Let's find out. I get inside of this function and I see that with functions means blah 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 blah. Uh, this name is really really bad. I already told you that a good name for functions is usually a verb in the imperative form and this is not. I'm probably creating some uh, functions that look a little bit like test functions. So that's why uh, we can do something like test functions. Okay, test functions is 
imperative and it means hey perform a test about functions uh, this one here cleaner approach we can say try a cleaner approach okay we can we can transform these functions into a more imperative way um, maybe it's a little better okay so now you start probably understanding the reason why functions are so powerful you can create some building blocks that instead of just console logging any value they are returning it so you can reuse this value and combine it some in, in other ways and uh, once you've got this you can have so many building blocks to combine and now you can combine them in even different ways I already told you that the problem that I wanted to solve was to have a string, to have it shouted, to have it yelled, and then um, wrapping it inside of an HTML tag. But now, with this power on our hands, we can do other things. For example, we can, I don't know, we can do something like just yell an HTML and no shout. Magic at all says, I don't do functions, I do sub, or worse, I use go to or JMP instead of JSR and ASAM. Oh my god, ah, uh, I, I feel you. <laughs> well, yeah, subroutines can probably be considered similar to functions, because you jump to some other place, but yeah, they are quite different. Um, I'm sorry <laughs> for you, functions are so nice. Uh, I hope that maybe while looking at this, uh, watching the stream, you will maybe gain the skills and the experience to also do some more higher level code, uh, which is so, so nice, so fun. Well, low, low level code is also fun, I think, but it's more, a little more abstract. Okay, so we can create something like function uh, and I'm going to say test. I run out of uh, of names actually. Um, test fewer functions. Why am I calling it like this? Because I want to do almost the same thing as before, but I want to yell and wrap in HTML, but not shout. So I can say const yelled string is equal to yell the string that I will get from as a parameter here. Magigra says, I'm old school and very low level minded. Oh, okay, okay. So th that's your comfort zone. I can understand it. Um, well, when I was at university, I had to study both low level, high level, everything. And uh, now I probably prefer more the high level. Well, actually, my specialty is architectures. So it's probably... Yeah, it's still probably high level, but it's also very abstract because I don't care about the problem at hand. I always think about extrapolating the problem and make it a framework, make it as abstract and as flexible as possible. But uh, yeah, I understand. Some people are more oriented to the low level, some people to the high level. Some people are more skilled with the uh, creative and uh, artistic part of this work. So they are more into the HTML, CSS and design. And, uh, well, the world needs every of our skills. They are complementary. So, you, so if you're more low level and more high level, then we can probably uh, team up for some problem that requires both skills. And this is so cool. So, test fewer functions will yell the string and then will wrap it in HTML. So const HTML string is the result of doing HTML on the yell string and then I'm console logging and then I also need to invoke this function in order to see what happens and I'm going to do it uh, with fewer functions. I'm going to use another word so it's uh, another sentence so we will uh, probably see what it ha what happens in the output. We can tell where this uh, function was used. Okay, so test fewer functions is very, very similar to what we've done here, but the only thing that is missing is the shouting. I don't care about shouting the string. I take the string as it is and I yell it. 
and then I HTML it, and then I console log it. So let's see what happens. Okay, I still see the hello world be from before. Now I see also the did you get it and awesome, which is proving that you can create, you can, you can use the same code that we've done so far with any kind of string. And then we've got fewer functions, as you see here, which is wraps in HTML, it is yelled because we have the three exclamation marks, but it's not shouted because it, it's not all uppercase. So as you can see, we're starting to combine functions in a way that was not even intended in the first place. But we can, we can do whatever we want. Magic at all, Statistic is okay. I'm into text scroller, parallax, raster interrupt. Ooh, that's cool. Yeah, parallax is uh, pretty, uh, pretty in lately. Every website should have a parallax. And also sprites, okay. Oh, I, love, uh, I love pixel art. I try to do some pixel art sometime, uh, from time to time, but um, I'm, I'm not really, really that good. Okay, so as you can see, we just combine these functions in a different way. And now we can even do more things. For example, uh, we can test a different order, for example. Given a string, we are going to perform the three operations, but in a different order. So given the string, for example, we can start um, yelling it. Const yelled string is equal to yell string. But then I want to apply the HTML. So very similar to what we've done before. I will apply HTML to the yelled string. So to whatever was the outcome of yelling. And then I'm going to shout. The question I have to you is, oops, shouted string, of course. Shouted string is the result of shouting the HTML string. The question I have to you is, will this behave exactly as some other thing that we've done so far, or will it behave differently? I'm going to also add a test different order. And I'm going to say different order, just to make it clear that this is the, fun the, 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 the string that we want to test. So of course, without executing the scripts, what is your hypothesis? Will this with different order behave exactly the same as, for example, test functions, which has is using the same functions, but in a different order? Because here we are shouting, then yelling, then HTMLing, and here we are yelling, HTMLing, and then shouting. Do you think they will behave exactly the same or not? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, drum roll. Let's find out maybe. Or if some of you say, hey, stop it there. I cannot, I cannot follow you. Please tell me. No problem with that. Still no, no, no response. Okay. I'm good to do it. Okay, I'm gonna clear. And I've got so many other, so many other things that I probably don't care about. So let's let's comment out the cleaner approach. And the functions. I will keep the smart ass way. No, no, I'm gonna <laughs> comment it too. So now the only thing that is going to be executed is test fewer functions and test different order. Um, no, probably I also want to test at least once the functions, uh, the, the basic ones. So first of all, go. Now, the first one is hello world. And this is no surprise because I get hello world and I shout it, I yell it, and I wrap it into HTML tags, and this is what we have. Okay. With fewer functions, as you know, we are yelling in HTML, but we are not shouting. So this, this string here 
is similar to this other one, except for, well, it has different words, but they are also not shouted. When I apply the functions in a different order, something slightly different happens. Because when I yell, it means that I add exclamation marks. When I wrap into HTML tags, it means that the string is now in between two H1s. And then I shout everything, which means that also the H1s are now shouted. As you can see, the H is capital. So as you can see, there is a difference in applying the functions in a different order, at least in this case. Okay, I hope that you are starting to understand what is the purpose of these functions. And now we can understand it even more if we want to make them even more parametric. For example, who told us that yell is adding three exclamation marks? Maybe it's one exclamation mark, or maybe it's, uh, I don't know, a question mark, or whatever we want. So in that case, we can even make this thing parametric. Instead of just applying three exclamation marks, we can decide to have a second parameter in the yell function, and say, I don't know, I call it excl, which by default, if I do not provide it, will maybe be the three exclamation mark. But I don't want to ha hard code this. I want to give the user of my function the ability to decide what to use as an exclamation mark. You can even do it uh, as you in, in different ways. For example, if you want to support Spanish, you know that exclamation marks are here, but also before the string, well, upside down. I don't know if you know this, probably yes, uh, but Spanish exclamation. When you do exclamations or even questions in Spanish, there's this uh, clever thing, which is about, don't we have any example here? I don't see any example, so let's see. Okay, feliz cumpleaños. And this has an exclamation mark at the end of the sentence, but also at the beginning of the sentence, but upside down. Which I think is pretty clever, because when you start reading the sentence, you already know the intonation that you have to give. Well, other, um, other languages, such as Italian or English, do not have this feature. So sometimes you read the whole sentence and then I say, oh, I had to, sh I had to shout it. I had, it, it, it was supposed to be an exclamation. Is it the same in Portuguese? Probably not. I don't remember. Portuguese, since we've got a couple of Portuguese here, uh, exclamation mark. Do you have the same? Nope, probably not. It's just the Spanish. Nope, okay. Yep, you, you are confirming that there's no such thing uh, as a Portuguese exclamation mark. So, the Spanish created this thing, and we want maybe to support this thing. So, we can have an inverse exclamation if we want to. And we can provide this inverse exclamation on the left of the string. And I'm, I'm not going to do this right now. But as you can see, we can parameterize things. And, or we can pass the language. And uh, according to the language that we are speaking, we can decide to add the exclamation marks in different, uh, in different ways. Okay? So now that we've got this second parameter, we can use it. For example, this test different order can yell, but with just using one exclamation mark, or maybe have one exclamation mark and question mark and exclamation mark, or the, um, how do you say, the, 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 the raged uh, internet person. You say exclamation mark with some ones, you know? Sometimes we also write it like this. Okay, so this could be any kind of exclamation mark you want. Let's see what happens if I now execute this stuff. So as you can see, the other two executions, hello world and fewer functions, were not affected by this because in test fewer functions, I'm yelling with no exclamation marks provided. And the same goes with this test function here. So when I'm not providing that parameter, the default parameter is applied. 
but in a test different order instead I'm using uh, my custom exclamation mark and this shows here so I parameterized the exclamation mark and I can do the same with HTML because I can do HTML but I can specify which tag I want to use for example by default the tag could be h1 but maybe I want to create a paragraph or whatever so I'm going to just replace the tag by interpolating this uh, tag variable instead of the h1 and this is the only thing that I need to do in order to have a function HTML which will work for any string that I want to wrap with HTML and now is also able to wrap the HTML the, the string in any kind of tag not only h1s now I can place it in paragraphs or in h2s or in links or in whatever you want so for example in uh, test different order I can say HTML but I'm going to use a different tag I'm going to use the paragraph for example uh, magic Ross says you preload a register before jumping to subroutine okay which probably is similar to defining a function before invoking it <laughs> I don't know I don't remember actually lower level programming I'm sorry for that but still pretty interesting okay so let's see if the different order will actually apply the paragraph instead of h1 yes it does it's a shouted p because after uh, wrapping in HTML, we are still shouting everything. But as you can see, yes. Oh, passing argument. Okay, you preload a register in order to pass the argument, and then you go to the subroutine. Okay, yeah. So yeah, subroutines can uh, are, are the low-level versions probably of uh, using functions and passing arguments. That's that's awesome. Yeah, I remember something like uh, put some value in some register, put some other value in the some register, then do the operation and put the results in some other register. It was something like that. Okay, so as you can see, these functions are becoming really, really parametric, and the the their genera their generality, <laughs> the, the fact that they are generic is provided by the fact that they can have one or more parameters that change the behavior of the functions and I will never stop saying it it becomes from the fact that I can just return the value instead of just consuming it right away because if I return the value then I can reuse this value any way I want I can even combine the result of these functions in multiple ways finally one last word about this is that uh, I could also be a smart ass with functions in fact this is the smart ass way yes but there's also a um, I can say smart ass smart ass oh come on smart ass way with functions which means you found the error. Okay, yep. Console log. Oh, sorry. Console tells me reference error tag is not defined. Sorry, terminal. Find the error myself. Awesome. So, what was the error? You probably misspelled tag, maybe. It was something like uppercase T. It's important to, to know what was the problem. And, uh, and of course, it could be nice to share it with. Oh, okay. It was uh, with some uppercase. Okay. Awesome. So now that we've got these functions, we could be tempted to use them uh, uh, as smart asses too. So since they are declared there below, I can use them here. I can do something like console log of uh, HTML of shout, or, or sorry, HTML of yell of shout of hello world. Probably this will have exactly the same results. Oh, wait a second. There's an exclamation mark. Uh, probably this will have the same results of this. Not really sure about that. So let's uh, let's f do it on the terminal. Uh, you know what? I'm going to change the word here so it will be more visible. This is a smart ass. Smart ass. And this will be functional smart ass. Which is not functional actually, but still. Uh, well, let's see. So, smart ass and functional smart ass 
behave exactly the same. As you can see, the text is shouted, it is yelled, and then wrapped in an H1, which is not shouted itself or not yelled itself. So yeah, you can, uh, you can write this thing as expressions, concatenated expressions, or you can do this as uh, a Russian doll of multiple functions invoking each other. But I think that this is pretty difficult to read. And probably a cleaner approach in both cases is to separate each execution in its own line. So without functions, it's like this. And uh, with functions, it will be like this. Okay. What else should I do? What else should I say about this? Well, I have something to say about functional programming, but it's not the, it's not the moment right now. So there's an, another way to write all this stuff uh, in a very clean way, composing functions together, but we will keep it like this for now. Magic Ross. Or if you have a lot of arguments to pass around, what you can do is storing the arguments as a memory address and you load them into register inside of your subroutine as you needed them. And when you say that you're storing the arguments at a memory address, this is probably the low level version of a JavaScript object, which is the topic that we will cover as soon as we finish this thing about functions. So yeah, as you can see, we, we can do anything. Um, but there was also a... a a very funny joke about web programming in assembly. Ah, oh, come on. Yep, something like this. Uh, open image in new tab so I can show you. Web development with assembly. You might as well just kill yourself right now. Assembly is perfect for low level tasks, but don't try to create a web application with assembly because it's way too low level. Every tool has its own purpose. So um, that's why I'm showing you JavaScript because you can use it for multiple purposes at high level. Uh, don't use JavaScript for low level stuff because it's not worth it. It's not uh, performant enough but it's very powerful nonetheless. Okay, so I hope that now you mastered what, at least what is the reason why we declare functions, why do we need parameters, and especially why we need to return the value instead of just console logging this value. Um, we can also do some other th strange things for example, if we change the order once more, function test crazy order, given the string, you know what? I'm just going to copy all this stuff and just and then just change it a little bit. Uh, so now I want to do the HTML string starting from the string itself, and I don't care about other parameters. So I'm just going to take the string, wrap it in an h1 tag, then I want to shout this string, and then I want to yell the whole thing. So I have to yell not string, not HTML string, not shout, but shout a string. I'm gonna put it here. And then I'm going to console log the final results. So if you are copying, pasting with me and you incur in some error, in some uh, um, result that is different from what I'm showing you, it is possible that you are not using the proper variable names. And this is another thing that I want to show you. I'm using constants because I like functional programming and I like to keep my variables not changed. This way I can inspect all of my variables, all the different steps. But if you don't really care about this functional programming thing, you can declare the variable as a variable like this, and you can call it results if you want to. And then you can override the same variable over and over again, which is not really different from what you do when you are converting a string to a number. We already done this. When you convert a string to a number, I'm going to show you here, you do something like uh, 
let result is equal to prompt something. I'm going to remove this, so don't copy this with me. Let result is equal to prompt, and then you say result is equal to number of results, right? So you are declaring one variable, and then you are reassigning a new value to the same variable in order to spare uh, variables, in order to spare registers, <laughs> let's say. You are reusing the same address in the register. So this is exactly what I'm doing here. Instead of creating every time a new variable or a new constant, I'm recycling the same variable. The result is HTML of string. And then I'll say, no, the result now is the result of shouting, the, res the result that I had before. The result is now yelling, the result that I had before. And finally, I console log the results. This is pretty um, useful, especially because now you can change the order Oops, sorry. You can change the order of some uh, of some um, functions here, of some invocations, and things will just work exactly the same. So to make it even uh, even better, I can say let results start as a string, and then let results is HTML of results. Now these three. Oh wait a second, I have to remove this. Now these three lines can be moved and swapped as you wish and the code still works well it will behave in a different way because i already showed you that there is a difference when you change the order of things but now if we want to experiment with things you can just mix this to uh, this three oh come on you can oh, you can make, I'm, I'm pressing alt which opens the uh, the toolbar and i shouldn't i want to press alt and the arrow keys to uh, move things around. So, as I told you, um, now that I'm using one variable and I'm reusing this variable multiple times, this code is even more flexible that I, because I can swap and uh, change the order of these things. And I'm back, internet went foobar. Oh, sorry, Magikaros, I... Uh, glad to see you here again. Okay, let's try this crazy order. So I'm going to test crazy order with a string called crazy order. And let's see what happens. Crazy order! Why did I say this is a crazy order? Well, because if you shout the results and then you wrap it in HTML and then finally you yell, you will see that the three exclamation marks are appended at the end of the HTML, which makes no real sense in HTML. But still, you can do this, okay? So, as you can see, the functions that we created are building blocks that we can reuse anywhere we want and we can combine them in different ways just because we created them so generic that they accept any kind of input and they will return an output that I can reuse however I want. Um, why did I tell you that this way we can write um, a JavaScript framework. It's not really true. But if you have a look at how the framework called React creates the hierarchy of components, look at this. This is part of the documentation of the React framework. And as you can see, if you um, in React you create a a hierarchy of components. You define your web page as if it was made of different bits and you care about creating separately the different bits of, oh, come on, of your application. So, for example, if you have, if you have a page which is done like this, the browser has this thing here, which is one, this thing here, which is two, then this other thing, which is three, and then this thing, this is five, this is four. Uh, you can decide to implement the different parts of your application into separate components that you can combine into a tree of components, which is probably quite stupid in this example because they look all the same level and then you get a tree of uh, elements with fathers and children so it's not really that good mm, is there a way is there a better better picture here 
I don't find a better picture here. So we can uh, we can just see it as look at this page here, for example. We've got the whole page, which is comprised of a header. Uh, maybe it has a main part, which is the scrollable part, and it has this right part, which is the menu. And then the menu is comprised, for example, of main concepts and installations, uh, installation, which are two children of the right menu. And main concept has all these lists of links, which are part of main concepts. So if we want to, we can describe all this uh, web page as a hierarchy of components. The root is the whole page, and the root has two children, which are the header and the, well, the body, the main parts. And the main part has a left side and a right side, so they are children of the main part. And the right side has multiple menus, and each menu has multiple menu items. So it's a hierarchy of components. And in React, you can describe every single component in a hierarchy, just like you see here, as a function that takes parameters and will construct some uh, HTML thing and whatever is performed in this calculation will be returned to you. So this is very, very similar to what we are doing right now. Magikaros, that will be an uh, exclamation mark as another paragraph if it's after the H1. Yes, exactly. If you try to place the, res the outcome of this in an HTML, the H1 will probably become its own paragraph. Yeah, that's true. So as you can see, React works very, you know, in a, in a very similar way to what we've done so far. There are differences, however. There are differences. There are slight differences. For example, as you can see, this is not a string. This is an H1 tag mixed with JavaScript, which looks kind of strange at a first glance, but in React, they decided to create this kind of language, which is called JSX, which is JavaScript mixed with XML. That's why in React you can mix this uh, HTML with JavaScript um, with JavaScript expressions, but you cannot do this in plain JavaScript. In fact, in plain JavaScript we had to wrap everything inside of a template literal. But apart from that, it's almost the same. Okay? So if you want to mimic the behavior of React, you can do something like Let's create a function called, uh, I don't know, uh, documents. The function documents will, I don't know, I'm just uh, messing around here. The function document will return an HTML document. And the only way I can return an HTML document here is with template literals. So I'm going to write a whole HTML here, HTML. And then uh, I'm closing HTML. I'm on a template literal, so I can do whatever I want here. I can go to new lines, I can interpolate things, I can do whatever. And the HTML has a head, uh, and it has a body. And in the body, I want to have a title. But maybe the title is something that I want to care about somewhere else. So I'm going to interpolate the results of doing title. And what is title? I'm going to put it here. Function title is a function that is going to return, well, an h1, an h1 tag with some string inside. If I want it to be parametric, I can do title given the string and I can interpolate the string here. Okay, this is how you build a title. And if I want to have a title here, I can say, well, this could be the home page. Or if I don't want this home page parameter to be um, hard coded inside of the document function, I can say that the document will accept a title and whatever title I get from here will be passed to the child function. So now I can console log the document, the, invoke, the, invo the results of invo invoking the document with the title of home and see what happens. No footer? 
Um, no, I wouldn't put a footer because the reason, the the difference, uh, how can I say, um, HTML is a document which usually has only two elements, the head and the body. There's no footer or no foot at the end of an HTML. And that's because head is not the header of your web page. Head is a tag that contains the invisible part of the document. It contains the some meta information, some meta tags. It contains usually the links to your CSS files. It contains the title description and other meta tags that are usually uh, useful for uh, web crawlers, for uh, um, for Google or DuckDuckGo rather than the user itself. And the body is what contains the visible part of the document. So in the body, if you want to, you can structure your web page as a header, as a main, as a, as a footer. But in this case, I'm keeping things really, really simple. And in the body, I don't have any distinction between header, main, navigation bar, footer, etc. I'm just putting an H1. But if you want, you can. You can add a footer here and you can add a header to, ooh, and you can add a main, etc., etc. But remember, you have to put them in the body because the head is something completely different. So, to recap, I created a function called document in which I'm building a web page. And in the web page, I want to have the title be a different function that I can change if I want to. For example, for, uh, the H1 can be inside of a header if I want to. Or the H1 can not be an H1, it can be an H2. But this thing that I'm changing is independent from the rest of the document. I care about the title only in this specific place. And then I'm going to use the title here, so the document will benefit from any changes that I'm doing. So let's try this function and probably it doesn't work. No, it does. As you can see, I've got my HTML with a head, which is completely empty, and the body contains h1, home h1. So as you can see, I wrote something that is similar to how React behaves. React behaves in a whole different way, but the syntax is pretty similar, right? So once you know functions, once you understand functions, you are one step closer to understanding JavaScript frameworks. And I think that's it for functions. Unless you have something to ask, any doubt, any problems, you want to uh, rehearse something, you didn't understand anything, just tell me. Otherwise, I'm going forward with the program. And going forward with the program, mind, it's not a huge change because we already know how to declare functions, but there's other, another two ways to declare functions. These are function declarations, these are function expressions, and these are error functions. So the last thing that we're going to do now, at least, at least before the coffee break, is to just see other ways to declare functions which behaves all, almost exactly the same. Angelo, why did we have to wrap the title function in the HTML in dollars? Here. So, in the document function, I'm returning a string. And since I want the string to be as uh, flexible as possible, I'm creating a string as a template literal. Template literals are special strings that allow me to go to new lines and they allow me to interpolate any JavaScript expression. So in here, I could have used not title, I could have used h1, and in here I can use the title. And it, this behaves exactly the same. But the thing that I want to show you here is that I'm not forced to describe the whole document in the document function. Sometimes I want to care about specific subproblems elsewhere. And once those problems are solved independently, I want to just include the solution in my overall solution. That's why instead of doing h1 with the interpolated title, I'm going to instead interpolate 
the result of executing the title function by passing the title parameter. This is very similar to what we've done with the shapes. Well, let's go back to shapes. Was it this one? This was the iso triangle. Wait a second. Um, no, we were in two, two functional shapes. In here, if you remember, we tried two approaches. One was the top down and one was the bottom up. And uh, it doesn't show here, but the top down approach was I want to build a full rectangle, then I'm going to address this problem at a high level and whatever details are too complex to address right now, such as how to build a single row, uh, I don't care right now. I'm just going to invoke build row, even if I didn't create it yet, but I will say I will leave the details of building a single row to um, a separate moment. And then once I know that this high level function works, I can then decide to care about how to build a single row. So again, I could take all this code and place it here in the overall function, but I think it's cleaner and it's more readable and it's much easier to understand if instead I split the problem into multiple subproblems. I solve them independently and then I use the solutions as part of the overall solution. And this is what we've done with the empty rectangle. With the empty rectangle, if I remember correctly, we decided to use the bottom-up approach. So, in order to build an empty rectangle, we said, we want to know how to build a full row, we want to know how to build an empty row, then we want to know how to build a series of empty rows, and then, finally, we will be able to build the whole rectangle, knowing that the first and the last line are full rows, and in between we'll have empty rows. So we started with the low-level function in this case. We started saying, let's, let's get rid of this problem, build full row and build empty row. Because once we know how to build these two, uh, then it's one less problem to keep in mind. I can uh, co collapse these two functions and forget about their implementation and give for granted that they work. They just work and, they, and I can use them wherever I want. So when I do build empty rows, which is a mid-level function, I'm going to call build empty row, which I know that it works. I don't know how it works, but it works. So I'm going to use it here and I'm going to create the sequence of uh, empty rows. And then finally, to build the empty rectangle, I'm just going to build a full row, build the empty rows, and then sandwich them back again. And I don't need to care how build full row and how build empty rows work. I just need to care that they work. And then I can combine the solution together. So this is similar to what we're doing here. Um, I'm creating a document, but if the creation of the title is too complicated, I can just delegate the creation of the title to its own function, and I can solve that problem independently. Magic Ross says, actually, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Not really sure that I understood you. Maybe the three, triple asterisk is a link or something that you wanted to share. I don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I saw your message too late probably and I don't know what it refers to. So <laughs> please tell me what you were saying. Um, okay, Angelo, is, it, is this clear? Any other doubts about this? In the meantime, we've got another two followers. Thanks a lot. It means that, it means a lot to me. Yes, thanks, awesome. Okay, so, yes, it was a link to the footer tag on W3School's website. Okay, Magic Ross, I'm sorry, but I had to disable posting links because as you probably saw a while ago, there are sometimes spam bots which uh, spam a link to how to gain followers by paying. And instead, I want to gain followers the clean way by just providing a good service for free. Uh, but still, yeah, okay, yeah. The footer tag on W3 schools. Footer tag W3 schools. The footer tag exists. 
and it describes the footer of a web page. But the footer is usually inside of the body. You don't have head, body and footer. You have footer inside of the body because the body holds the visible part of your uh, web application. So if you look at body here, the body is giving is, is showing you something while the head usually has something that is not shown to the user this title is actually shown to the user but it's not the heading this sorry this title is usually shown as the title of the tab but other than that this title is actually used by search engines in order to show you this link here this title here this is the title that uh, search engines crawl and then show to the user that does that performs the search so yes you can have a footer and you can also have a header but the header is different from the head let me see the header here it is the header tag can be inside of an article for example these are new semantic tags that we uh, have in uh, html5 but the header is still part of the body. It's not outside of the body. Header, footer, main, article, uh, section are all part of the body. The HTML only contains two tags, H uh, head and body. And the head should not be confused with the header. Finally, we go to a new topic, which as you will see is really, really similar and really, really easy. So I'll create a new file called 02 function expressions. And this topic will actually answer a question that was probably asked by uh, Angelo last time. I already show you that you can declare a function and this is a named function. Why is it so? Because this function has a name, <laughs> right? So console log, uh, I don't know, named function. This is a function declaration and you already know about this. So function declaration. This is a function declaration which creates a named function. I already told you just, uh, just a glimpse of this, but I already told you that you can also create anonymous functions. Anon, anonymous functions. Anonymous functions such as this one. Function, no name. Sometimes you put a space in here, sometimes not. Uh, I don't know what is the standard right now. Probably there must be a space. Uh, I usually prefer to not have a space, but maybe having a space is better. So this is an anonymous function. It's still a, uh, it is still a function declaration because you are declaring a function but without giving it a name. There's not much to say about anonymous functions rather than they have no use like this. Because when you declare a function as an anonymous function, you are declaring it, but since it has no name, you're not able to use it. You're not able to invoke it if it stays like this. Um, Magic Ross says, yes, it was a link to the forum. Ah, I understand, just like there is a header too, exactly. You can call something that has no name? No, exactly. You cannot call this function right as it is because it has no name. But anonymous functions have a purpose sometimes. One of the purposes is uh, something that I showed you last time, which I called it an IIFE. Which, is, which means immediately invoked function execution. And what does it mean? It means that in uh, early JavaScript days, we didn't have the concept of modules, and you still don't know what a module is because I haven't explained it to you. So in order to encapsulate bits of code, but also having them executed, we had to do something like wrapping everything inside of a function, like uh, function run me or invoke me. You 
declare variables, my var, you do whatever you want, uh, you console log this variable, and you know that whatever is inside of this function will be local to the function. So if you want to run this code, but you don't want to create global variables, then you can encapsulate everything inside of this function and then you invoke this function. This is a stupid, a very easy trick to execute something but not exposing anything to the outside world. But there's also another way. If you want to, you can do an IIFE, which is not this one here. Uh, the IF, IIFE um, uses the fact that you can wrap this function in a couple of parentheses and then add another couple of parentheses to say, hey, whatever function is declared in this, uh, just execute it immediately. So you don't need to execute this function anymore. You just need to declare a function and then as soon as you declared it, you, invo you invoke it immediately. And this is why it's called an IIFE, because you are immediately invoked the function that you just declared. And as you can see, there's no real need to give a name to this function anymore, because as soon as you declare it, you just invoke it. So you can remove the name, and this just works. This is an IIFE. And I'm telling you just for historical reasons. I don't think we are using IIFEs anymore nowadays, or at least we are probably using them without knowing that we are using them. For example, if I go to the code of uh, jQuery, which is a very famous JavaScript library that is still very, very used nowadays for some reason. I, would, I don't want people to use it, but still, we have people that use it, a, uh, use it a lot. Well, you would see, if you look at the code of jQuery, that there is something similar. As you can see, there is a function, an anonymous function, that takes some parameters too, that does a lot of stuff, really a lot of stuff. jQuery is a huge library compared to the functions that we created so far. And at the end of this, you will probably see something like... Um, no, this is slightly different. But... Oh, uh, where is it? jQuery trim... Ah, uh, I cannot find it. Oh, come on. Okay, I don't see it here. But here we get another f anonymous function. Maybe I should go a little, a little up, up, up. Or maybe not. Well, let, let me see. Um, what is it at the end? At the end, we've got this. So, okay, there must be something in between. Let me see if I can find it. Probably not. No, this, this, this thing is too huge. Oh, wait a second. Look at that. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but here we still have another IIFE. Here we've got a, not an anonymous function that is executed as soon as it's, it is declared. So as you can see, IIFE are actually used somewhere in, uh, in code. Uh, Magical Ross says, ooh, a bit like the text and ship register call. You want to be sure it works? Write it twice, kinda, do it, do it now. I have no clue. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this, uh, you're going to way too deep in the text, uh, I don't know what's the text and ship register call. I'm not even sure it's uh, related to programming. Is that, uh, is that related to poker? <laughs> no idea. Well, you don't rewrite it twice, but put the... Okay, yeah, you put the parentheses, exactly. So, this is an IIFE, and I'm just going to show you for historical reasons, or if you're curious about looking at libraries that are out there, even libraries that are widely used, you could incur in something like this. Or, there's also another variant which uses the parentheses inside, which has exactly the same meaning. But, uh, as we saw, the... IIFE that, IIFE that we saw is, uh, was, was shaped like this. So, we can use anonymous functions. And another way we can use anonymous functions is through function expressions. Which means 
Wait a second. Uh, it's related to the 80 columns display of the Commodore 128. You have to write the register twice to be sure that chip to what you want. Oh, okay, so it was related to programming. <laughs> I thought that you were talking about chips in, in poker. That's good to know. Uh, for any low-level programmers out there who are watching, uh, please confirm this. <laughs> I, I'm, I must say that I'm too young for Commodore programming. I started programming... Uh, way after Commodore. Uh, I'm old, but I'm not that old. You're older than me, much gross. Uh, we, already, we already said that. So, you can also do functions expressions, which means that you can create an anonymous function, like console log ooh, function expression. Oops. And then the result of declaring this function can be stored in a variable, like uh, const my func. You can, or var, uh, or let my func, whatever. I, I always prefer to use constant whenever I can. You're 46. Okay, not, not that much um, older than me. I started very young at seven. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, okay, I see. Um, I'm 38, by the way, and... Uh, I started programming only at university because before university the computer was something that I wasn't allowed to touch almost and I had no clue how to start programming. I didn't do it by myself. I started from scratch from day zero at university. Before that I didn't know almost anything about programming. So function expressions means that you can declare a function which can be named or can be not named, it doesn't matter. But now, when you store it inside of a variable, this variable is actually pointing to a function. So you can use it like this. Let's try. Let's try everything. So, if I use a named function, I'm going to do it on the browser. I declared a function. And I can invoke it like this, named function. And there's nothing new about that. But I can declare an anonymous function. And as you can see, okay, uh, the developer tools started to become a little smarter. They are saying, hey, what are, why the hell are you declaring a function with no name? You're never going to use it. So function statements require a function name. Otherwise, I'll never, you'll never be able to use this function. And you're right, of course. So let's try this function as an IIFE. I think I can do this. And go. It's, it's printing too. But the cool thing about this execution is that I don't have any reference to my var. Because my var was declared in the scope of the function, so it was born, lived, and died inside of the function. So as I told you, IIFE was a clever trick that in early JavaScript we used to have modular code, which means code that is able to execute but doesn't expose anything that we do not want to expose. I want this variable to live only inside of this function. So I wrap the execution of this code inside of this IIFE and the function will be executed not making my var exposable from outside. And then we've got function expressions. So we can declare an anonymous function, but we can store the results of declaring this anonymous function in a variable. And this variable is a reference to the function. So I can just call it. I can invoke it. Let's see what happens. Where's the, where's the, where's the invo invocation? Okay, I'm going to write it. So I declare the function and then I'm going to execute it. And it's printing function expression. So as you can see, this almost looks exactly the same as a function declaration. So why do I need two different ways to declare functions? Why I, should I do function declaration instead of function expression? What are the benefits of one or the other? Well, there are some differences, slight difference, but they are. So for example, 
let me see what happens if I say type of these things change over time so let me check type of named function because I declared it later before it is a function and if I ask what is name function it's a function called name function with this body oops sorry uh, okay we know this and what is the type of um, my func which is the function expression yes this is also a function and what if I go with my func and see inspect the value of my func oh it's an anonymous function so oh come on so here you just you're already starting to see a slight difference when you when you inspect the value of named function you see the name of the function oh come on what am I what am I clicking oh I shouldn't click on the results okay I shouldn't click here otherwise it's going to open the sources panel so uh, I was trying to not click on the function but to highlight things but I'm not able to so if I inspect the named function I will see that it's a function with a named named function but if I inspect my func with a function expression its value is an anonymous function which sometimes can make it a little more complicated to uh, to, to, to debug because I see an anonymous function it doesn't make much sense but as I told you uh, the name of this function uh, can actually be added so this could become function expression I can give a name to this function expression and I think it's going to work uh, I have to refresh the browser however because I'm declaring constant things and I don't want to redeclare them so if I now change my function expression by giving a name to this function which was anonymous before let's see what happens okay everything works the same the type of uh, my func of course is still a function and if I inspect what my func is, it will give me a name. So I can provide a name here. It's not mandatory because it's still going to work. But if I want to, I can still give a name if I want to. Uh, usually when I do function expressions, I don't give a name because there's no need to. I'm still going to invoke the function as my func, not as function expression. In fact, I don't even know if I can use function expression as a name no I cannot because this name lives only in the scope of the same function so even if I give a name to this function the real the final name of this function will be the name of the variable not the name of the function itself so there's no real need actually to give a name to the function in the function expression other than having it uh, available when you inspect the function but still this is pretty uh, it, it's uh, it's probably confusing because you have a function which has a name my func and when you inspect it it will have a different name so probably I would suggest you to never use the name in a function expression Oh, there's a huge message by Magic Ross. The why you have to write the 80 columns twice is that it is separate and run on its own with its dedicated RAM or the 40 columns chip, I also known as the VIC-2, inherited from the C Commodore 64, share the bus with the CPU. And what happened is 50% of the time when you write to the 80 columns memory, the VIC-2 steals the cycles it needs from the bus and the 80 columns that get its data. This is really interesting because this is giving you other guys, you students, uh, a glimpse of what low-level programming is. Here we are dealing with something that could probably seem quite abstract to you. But as you can see from Magicaross's messages, uh, Magicaross has to deal with very low-level stuff that deals with memory registers and CPU cycles, etc. The cool thing about high-level programming is that we don't need to care about the internals of a computer to solve problems. Because we're dealing with a completely different class of problems, high-level problems, problems that are closer to human problems, not computer problems. We solve this with computers, but we solve human problems. Okay, so so far I always I only told uh, bad things about functions expressions and I think that in this comparison function declarations always win and it's true they always win to me 
apart except from certain situations in which you are forced to use function expressions. Well, not forced, but sometimes, yeah, you, you need to. Uh, we never saw anything about objects, but for example, if you want to react to the pressure of a button, you usually write some code like uh, button dot, if you have a button, if you have a variable called button that is a reference to the current button being clicked, you can attach something like uh, called an event handler, such as button dot on click, and here you're going to attach an anonymous function. And th there's no way to add a function declaration here. Well, actually there is one, but this way is much more convenient. So you can say console log clicked. Okay, this code is not going to work because we don't have a button on the page. But if you're curious, we can start doing something that uses some HTML. Uh, let me try new file event handler dot html I'm going to create an html page Magicaro says I like computer problems they are often more easy to solve than human problems um, are you sure? <laughs> you know what computers are very abstract very low level but they are also quite predictable Humans are not as predictable. So yes, they are, e they are easier because humans are sometimes so unpredictable that it's pretty difficult to solve human problems. Uh, but there are problems and problems. Sometimes there are very low level difficult problems and there are very easy human problems. So uh, as for me, I wouldn't generalize too much. But uh, yeah, I, I'm probably so so used to human problems right now that probably low-level problems would be quite difficult and daunting for me but it's just how we are it's just a matter of opinions so event handler.html i'm going to do a exclamation mark enter in order to have the boilerplate for all this i'm going to explore something that i haven't done in in a few years because usually we don't do this and I'm going to show you things that require a little bit of knowledge about objects, etc. But we are going to just give for granted that we know no objects or we don't need to and re truly understand what an object is. Uh, an object, you can say, is something that contains data and contains functions and we can invoke those functions or ask for data. So I'm going to call event handlers here. And we already stumbled upon multiple objects, actually. Um, one object was the math object. Math is an object to which I can ask pi, which is a constant, or I can ask a function, like round some number. So this is the only thing that you need to know. If you know what is an object, uh, well, if you know the name of the object, you can ask that object things, okay? <laughs> That's the only thing that you need to do. And as you can see, this looks very similar. Uh, this, If this is an object, you can ask the object, uh, The you, you can even set things to the object, like setting an on-click function like this. So here, I'm going in the body to click, to write a button. You know how to write a button, right? And it says, click me. And I think that the, that's the only thing that I need to do. Now that I've got a button, I can open a script in here. As always, I'm opening the script right in the page just for the sake of having everything in the same page. In production, in real life, you're never going to create a script in the page, probably. You're going to create a separate script in the separate JavaScript file and then refer to it in the page. But here we want to have everything on the same page. So in the script, I have to find a reference to this button in order to do something with it. And I will try like this. Let's see if it works. I'm uh, addressing an object called document. The document is an object that represents the whole web page, the whole web document. And I'm going to ask to this document a specific thing 
which will be query selector, which is not my favorite kind of name, and I'm passing a string called button. If everything is good, this function should find this element. And I can store the reference to the element as a variable. Const button is equal to document query selector button. I hope it works. It should work. And now I can do things to this button. For example, uh, an old fashioned way to react to the click of a button should be something like button, as I said before, dot on click, not really sure it works, but probably yes, is equal to some function. And in the function, I'm just going to alert something. Alert clicked. Okay, if everything goes well, I manage to uh, get a reference to the button. And then as soon as I click on the button, this function will be invoked. Magic Ross says, step one, draw a box. Step two, set up an interrupt on the mouse to check if it is above or box. Step three, if the mouse button is pressed. Oh, wait, sorry, low level minded. <laughs> Love it. Okay, so this page should work, probably. I'm not going to open the live server because this is a stupid page. I'm just going to open the containing folder and just open this file as if it was a file on Google Chrome. Don't need to do fancy stuff like live server. Okay, there is a button. There is a button, very small, so I'm going to make it bigger. A really not nice looking button. If I go to the sources panel, I should find my HTML page with all the things that I need here. And if I click on the button and cross fingers, oh, it worked. <laughs> Well, to my defense, you asked. Yes, yes, I asked, and, uh, and you did well in telling me. Uh, what you're saying is very interesting, and it also gives me a chance to slow down. <laughs> because if you don't interrupt me with your messages, I'm going to go so fast that people are going to complain. So your messages are both interesting and allow me to uh, change the pace, slow down a little bit for those who are in need. Okay, so as you can see, this code that seems to be working is using a function expression. And a function expression in this case was useful because I can declare an anonymous function and attach this function to this variable here, which is a variable that belongs to the button. If you want to know what is a button in this case, we can maybe even debug. I can add a breakpoint here and I can refresh the browser and I will inspect what the button is. The button is an object that has a lot of different uh, properties. They are called properties. They are variables. Most of them are null, as you can see. And uh, some of them are instead valued. Among those, there should be an on click. Uh, they are in uh, alphabetical order, so if I remember how alphabetical order works, on click is null. But probably at the end of the script, the button now has an on click property. And I could probably inspect it like here. The button is there, and button.onClick is a function, an anonymous function, with whatever I attached to the on-click property. So everything's working. And as you can see, I, I can access the button here in the global scope because whenever I declare something inside of my script, it creates a global variable that people can use and inspect. If I want to prevent this variable to be accessible from outside the execution, I can call an IIFE function in which I'm going to wrap all of this code here. I'm going to add some uh, extra spaces to make it clear oh, the, um, 
what I'm doing, and then I'm going to execute this function. If I do this, the code works exactly the same as before, but now I have no reference of my button. In fact, I'm not even able to write it. Okay, so long leave IIFE because in such scenarios, they prevent unwanted people to inspect the value of my button, which is kind of useless nowadays because maybe I can go to the sources panel, I can still click on this thing as, uh, to have a debugger, and I can inspect what a button is. But at least I cannot override the behavior of the button from outside. When I didn't have a, an IEE, -E -I, -I, -E, I could also use the button and do something with it. I could uh, maybe even prevent the on-click. I would say on-click is null. And if I do this, when I click on the button, well, it's, it's not working right now, but um, when I click on the button, I'm overriding this, uh, this, this behavior. And uh, this could be even unwanted. So let's remove the IIFE. So button is now a global variable. The button should do on click, and it does. But now, if I say button dot on click is equal to null, I'm probably overriding this behavior, and it's not going to click anymore. Oh god, I broke it! I broke my website. So I don't want people to override this default behavior. And how do I do that? Well, I wrap. Oops, I wrap my code in an immediately invoked function execution and now the button is not accessible so it means that I cannot override its behavior I hope that I'm saying it right I I F E my stomach is starting to gargle um, I I F E oh expression I'm sorry not execution sorry of course because this is a function expression that is immediately invoked so I'm sorry for that. Wrong term. This is an immediately invoked function expression because it's a function expression, anonymous, that is immediately invoked just after, as soon as I declare it. Now it's 12 o'clock, it's coffee time. So we will be back in five minutes, 12.06 my time at least. 1.06 um, UTC time. See you in a while. Bye.
a few moments later. Here I am again. Uh, I know that five minutes didn't pass because when I was going to go uh, uh, to coffee break, I saw the clock shifting from 12.06 to 12.07, so probably there's still one minute left. But um, I still would like to stay here for those of you who hadn't the chance to copy everything or just want to see the code that we were uh, creating before the coffee break. So I'm not going to start immediately, but I'm taking my time to just show you this code. Uh, this unfortunate function here called query selector, very unfortunate name. Uh, it's a new addition and I think that they completely messed up the name because names should be in imperative form. This should be something like select by query, select with a query or just select, I don't know, but query selector is really, really bad. Now it's 12.07, I see. So let's start. Okay, uh, so this is a way to add an event handler to the click of a button. Uh, I can also do it in a different way. And watch out because this is one of those things that non-JavaScript developers mess up including myself. I, I saw, I, I didn't understand, okay, 1207 here too. Uh, I didn't understand at first how references to functions worked in JavaScript at first, so it was really, really um, frustrating for me at first. And I said, oh, JavaScript is a ugly language. It's uh, unintelligible, but it's actually pretty interesting. It's uh, very intelligible. Um, just one note about semicolons. Since this is a function expression, since this, this is uh, an assignment, usually function expressions have a, an ending semicolon, which I don't like, and I always forget. That's why you know that semicolons in JavaScript are optional, so I usually never put semicolons, and it just works. I don't care about where should I put semicolons. In function declarations, I should not put them. But in function expressions, I should put them if I want to be strict. But I don't care. I'm just not going to put them anywhere in my daily work. But in here, I'm just putting semicolons whenever is needed. So, yep. So another way I can attach an event handler here is, well, pretty basic. I can declare a function called, I don't know, handle click. And this function is going to alert clicked. Okay, so I'm declaring a function and I'm declaring it with a name. And then the bit of magic is I'm going to replace this function expression with a reference to the underlying function. A reference, watch out, I'm not invoking the function, I'm just giving a reference to this function as if it was the reference to some variable. This is the tricky part. 90% of the people that mess up something in JavaScript are usually invoking the function instead of just passing a reference to that function. Let's see if this works. Okay, click me. Yes, clicked. So as you can see, even in this case, I don't really, really need to create function expressions. I can create a function declaration as always, and then just attach a reference to this function declaration. Uh, so what's the real purpose of function expressions? Well, probably the main reason is that sometimes we need a function just for one purpose. I'm never going to reuse this function anywhere else in my code. This function is strictly tied to the event of on click to the button. So sometimes I don't want to uh, come up with a name for the function and I don't want to declare the function and then refer to it later on. I just want to put it here and that's it. So that's the reason why probably function expressions are still useful nowadays. You can create your code without function expressions at all, but sometimes they are useful. There is still, however, another gotcha. And I'm going to show you right now. 
So let's go back to where we, I, when I declare the function. This code works because when I'm declaring a function with a function declaration, the function is subject to hoisting, which means that the function, even though it's declared here on, nine, on line 19, it's actually the same as if it was declared on line 14. It's declared on top of the file. I can declare it on, uh, below, but it will still be interpreted as if it was declared on top. <clears throat> Magic Ross, I wonder would that be equivalent of load from memory indexed? Probably yes, definitely. Um, so, but I already told you that any function declaration can also be written as a function expression. So I can also change it as const, let's call it const handle click is equal to an anonymous function that does this, this and that. This will not work. <laughs> Even though I changed the function declaration into a function expression and they do exactly the same thing, this doesn't work. And why doesn't this work? Because the variables that I declared like this are not subject to hoisting. So in this case, I'm saying that the button will have attached to this onClick property a variable that I haven't declared yet and it's not subject to hoisting. So I will have an error which says, hey, handle click was used before being declared. Probably. Yep, cannot access handle click before initialization. So when you do function expressions, you have to make sure that these function expressions are actually declared before being invoked. This will work because I'm declaring the function expression and then I'm using it. Let's try. No errors, everything works. So another problem with function expressions is that they are not subject to hoisting and it matters a lot where you are declaring those functions. Angelo, why do we not have to put the parentheses at the end of uh, mm -mm, handle click? So why shouldn't I put this here? I would tell you, I, I would give you two answers. The first answer is a practical answer. It, look at this. If I put the parentheses here, it means that button dot on click is equal to the result of invoking handle click. What does it mean to invoke handle click? It means that I will alert clicked. So if I keep the parentheses here, what will happen is this. Press F5, <laughs> clicked without even pressing on the button. Because when I invoke the function handle click, it will immediately alert clicked. What we want instead in JavaScript is to pass a reference to the function because JavaScript itself is going to invoke this function only when the button is clicked. So I just pass a reference to the function and then when I click on the button, it will be the browser that will say, oh, the button was clicked, then I'm going to invoke this function myself. Okay, so that's the reason why you should never invoke the function by yourself. You pass a reference to the function and then you allow the browser to invoke it. Now the function is declared and when I click, it will be the browser itself to call that function. The second answer that I want to give you is just a trick, uh, a magic trick. The magic trick is something like this. Um, I'm going to go back to the usual anonymous function, like this. So if I want this function to not be anonymous, I can say that this function is called handle click. But the function handle click can also be stored inside of a variable. Um, we, we did it before, we said const Oh, come on. Const handle click is equal to exactly this function. So if you want to make a comparison with the similar, with simple numbers, you can say const a is equal to one, const b is equal to one. 
But since those two values are equal, you can just say const b is equal to a, whatever is the value of a. Okay, you just pass a reference to the same variable. And you can do the same with functions, because functions are very important in JavaScript. They are first-class citizens in, in JavaScript. So, if you have a variable, handle click, which contains this value here, then it means that instead of this value here, you can pass a reference to this variable. And as you can see, I don't need to put extra parentheses. I'm just passing a, 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 a reference to the variable. I'm not invoking a function. I'm just passing a reference to the variable instead of providing the value myself. Hope it makes sense. But I thought that the purpose of on click is that it's only executed when the button is actually clicked. So why is it run automatically? Um, when you do this, you are, let's say you are just passing the results of a function invocation and storing it in here. You can do it even with, without event handler. So if you have, we already saw it. If you say const result is equal to shout string, then this means that you are shouting the string and you're storing the result in this variable called results. If I instead I say const result is equal to shout without invoking it, then in this case result is a variable that stores not the result of shouting, but just stores the function declaration. In fact, result now is actually a function that I can apply to a string. This was just a copy of the same function, actually. Well, it's not a copy, it's a copy of the reference. So this is exactly what happens here too. Um, yes, onClick has the purpose of attaching a function that will be called whenever the button is clicked. But that is also why onClick should have a value of a function. OnClick should be the function that will be invoked automatically by the browser whenever the user clicks on a button. And if I'm providing handle click with parentheses, I am not providing a function to OnClick. I'm providing whatever is the outcome, the outcome of executing this function, which is actually alerting. And I don't want to alert immediately. If I execute handle click right now, it's going to alert immediately. Instead, I want to pass a reference, so I will not, never invoke handle click by myself. Handle click will be invoked under the hood by the browser as soon as the button is clicked, because this is bound as an event handler. So it's a function that is executed only when a certain event occurs, not when I want to, but when the event of click occurs. Hope it makes a little more sense. There is also another way to attach event handler nowadays. And the other way is something called button.addEventListener, which has the same purpose actually. AddEventListener is a function this time. And the function requires, if I remember correctly, at least two, um, two parameters. The first one is a string telling you what the event is. For example, it could be the event of click. But since we already have the event of click, I'm just using the event of uh, hover. Probably hovering on the button will still work. And then the second parameter is the callback function. It's called callback function because it's a function that is called back as soon as the event uh, requires it. So the callback function can be an anonymous function in which I can say alert. Uh, probably alert will be too much. Let's console log this time. Console log hovered. Okay, this is another way to attach event listener. This is a new way to attach event listeners. Uh, we usually don't use this anymore. Um, let's see if this works. Nothing changes, but as soon as I hover on the button, no, nothing changes. <laughs> so it's not hover. Uh, so add events listener hover. Don't we have a hover event? Oh, it's called mouse over because I hover with a mouse. So let's try with mouse over. Sorry, mouse hover. And let's try again. So I'm hovering on the button. 
Nothing changes! Okay, so I have to read the documentation a little more. Add event listener mouse over. Oh, it's mouse over, not mouse hover. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Okay, mouse over. Or mouse enter, maybe even. Let's try with mouse over, not hover. I'm going to go over the button. Yay! Hovered! And now it's going to, ho to, to print every single time I hover on the button. So, this is really, really similar to this other thing here. I can attach an event handler by just assigning a reference or, well, a function expression to this property. Or I can use this fancy function, add event listener, in which I specify with a string what is the event I want to listen to and what is the function that I want to attach. And the same goes with what I said before. If I want to, I can declare this function elsewhere, like uh, handle hover. And in here, instead of declaring a function, I can pass a reference to that function without invoking it immediately. Because if I invoke it immediately, as soon as, I, as, soon as the browser interprets the whole script, it will log hovered. And instead, I don't want to log immediately. I want this function to be attached somehow as the event listener of this event. So in, as soon as this event occurs, the button itself will actually invoke this function independently. So now everything is still working the same, but I did it with a reference to the function. Don't worry, because we will see a lot more about function references later on. I, I plan to have one slide deck here about functional JavaScript. It's the, it's the la le last thing that we're going to do, or probably the second to last thing that we're going to do before improvising, because I don't plan to stop there. Uh, if you are still with me, I can show you a little bit of JavaScript libraries, JavaScript frameworks, or even patterns or test-driven development. I can give you whatever you want to. Don't worry about that. Okay, so now we know about function expressions. Function expressions are something like this. You declare a usually anonymous function and you store the result of this declaration inside of a variable or you can use it immediately right away s attaching it to something else just like we did before when doing button on click is equal to this function here okay this is the reason why we use function expressions it's just to attach usually callbacks to other things uh, or like in here I can pass a reference or I can just declare the function an, as an anonymous function because I don't care about its name I just want this function to be executed as soon as I hover with my mouse on the button and they are exactly the same in one case of course I have to uh, specify a name and then pass a reference in this case since I'm using this function just once, uh, well, I'm declaring this function just once and I'm attaching it to something that we will use it multiple times, I don't even need to, to specify a name. And I can define these references as function expressions, just like I did here, or as function declarations, as I did here. The difference, the main difference is with function declarations, you can declare the functions at the bottom of the file because they are subject to hoisting. But with function expressions, you cannot. So you, you are stuck to declare the function before using it, just like we did here. And then, of course, function expressions could be useful for IIFEs, immediately invoked function expressions. So, as you can see from the tutorial, this is a function declaration, this is a function expression. Not very different one from the other. They have a slightly different behavior, especially when you think about hoisting. But other than that, they behave exactly the same. <clears throat> uh, blah, blah, blah. Why is there a semicolon? I already told you. 
callback functions. Okay, here they are talking about uh, a generic callback function and I think it's worth looking at this example. I started talking about callback functions as functions that are called back as soon as something happens. In this case, it was an event from the browser. But a callback, functions, a callback function is usually just a function that is passed as a parameter of another function. Look at this function declaration. Function ask is having three parameters here. Question, which is actually a string of text. And then we've got yes and no, which are functions. How do I know they are functions? Well, because in the body of the ask function, I'm passing a couple of parentheses in here. So it means that yes and no are actually two functions that are passed. And this is the beauty of JavaScript, the beauty of functional languages in general. You cannot do the same with other languages such as Java prior to version probably 8 or 10 uh, because other languages are, do not treat functions as first-class citizens as JavaScript does. In JavaScript you can use functions and pass functions inside of other functions and you can turn them around as you please. So function ask question yes and no. If you remember the confirm function, it's similar to the prompt function, but it just gives you two choices, OK or cancel. So you can also do the prompt here, but remember, confirm is just one browser related function that opens. I'm going to show you here again. All right. This is going to open a pop up like the prompt or the alert. But the only thing that you can do here is just say OK or cancel. There's no text input uh, in which you can pass any value. And OK will give you true, cancel will give you false. All right? OK, true. And uh, so what it's doing here, it's trying to generalize a question. If you ask a question, then you want to do something. You want to, for example, show OK or show Cancel. But maybe when you do ask, you also want to use this function called ask in other ways. So I'm going to show you this. Uh, let's do... Um, let's not do a new file. I'm going to do it here. OK, so let's do a code which is similar to what we saw so far. Let's answer is equal to confirm did did you understand this is not related to functions but we are using a function which is the confirm function which is provided automatically by the browser so let answer is confirm if the answer is true which means that I can say answer equal equal to true or just answer because it's a it's a truthy value it's a boolean value actually so it's it's true or false and nothing else then in this case i want to for example alert awesome otherwise i'm going to alert something else for example i will repeat it once more okay this code is good but it could become more parametric if I wrap this code inside of a function. So now I'm going to say function ask, not ax, ask. And this function will allow me to have this code encapsulated in the function and also be parametric because in this case I can provide a question as a parameter so I can ask multiple questions now. I just need to replace this hard-coded string, did you understand, with the more generic question parameter that comes from outside. So now I can ask the question itself. Oops, sorry, I copied the wrong thing. Did you understand? But I can also ask other things, like ask, are you happy? Are, are you starving <laughs> because we are close to lunchtime? Or whatever, okay? So I'm asking something. And this already works pretty well. I can copy the code and I can go to my browser here. Did you understand? 
No. I will repeat it once more. So with this function, I was already able to parameterize the question. In fact, I can also do ask of another thing. Uh, are you hungry? The problem with this execution, however, is that when I say OK, yeah, it says awesome. <laughs> OK, are you hungry? Awesome. And when I say no, I will repeat it once more. What? No, if I'm hungry, if I'm hungry, then I must, I must eat. And if I'm not hungry, then I should not eat. Otherwise, I will get fat. So I want to also customize the behavior that I will provide if the answer is yes or if the answer is no. I don't want to just uh, customize the message. I can, and we can do it as a, as a sidestep. I can say, um, let's say, yes message and no message. If I parameterize these two, then in this case, the functions should be called with another two parameters. So one is the yes message, awesome. And the other one is the no message. I will repeat it once more. These two parameters will be passed to the alerts. So these messages are parametric now. They are not hard coded in the function. And now I can change things in the are you hungry? Are you hungry too? Uh, then eat. Or if I'm not hungry, then drink. It's always good to drink some water. Maybe you forget it. I usually forget to drink some water, so I'm going to. You see how useful these lessons are to me too, because they remind me to eat water. Okay, so now we parameterized a little more. Now we can customize the question and we can even customize the message that we are going to provide if the user says yes or if the user says no. Whoops. Wait a second. Okay. I'm going to place everything here. Did you understand? Yes. Awesome. But also, are you hungry? No, not yet. Then drink. Okay, yes, I'm going to drink. Awesome, but we can do more. We can even customize the action that we will take when the user says yes or no. Instead of always alerting, alerting is hard coded. And we don't want to hard code the fact of alerting. Maybe I want to console log, or maybe I want to send an email to my mom because she must know that I'm, a, that I'm hungry. So in that case, I want to have a different kind of parameter here. It's not the message that I want to alert. This will be the callback function when the user says yes. We can call it on yes. And this can be called on no. I'm using these uh, as a generic name for a callback function. Sometimes you also use handle yes and handle no because these are functions that you that will be invoked to handle the answer yes and to handle what happens when the answer is no. So in this case, handle yes is a function. And as a function, I can invoke it. Handle yes, invoked. And handle no, invoked. The function declaration is fine. But now we have to change something in these two because now we are passing strings and we expect functions. So we need to change those two functions and we can change them with a function expression. We can say function return, uh, not, not return, alert awesome, which is exactly the same behavior that it had before. And this was the first callback function. And then the second callback function will be function that will alert. <clears throat> I will repeat once more. It looks kind of strange because now the function invocation 
is spanning five whole lines. I could do this all in one line actually. I can remove all these all these extra new lines but as you can see if I remove these extra new lines the code becomes quite long and still difficult to read. So that's why I'm using these new lines. They make no harm. They probably also improve a little bit the readability. If you want your code to be even more readable, you can add even more indentation. So since ask requires three parameters, you can put every parameter or it's on its own new line. So I can say ask, go to a new line. Did you understand? And on a new line, I say awesome. And on a new line, I'm putting the callback for the no. This, although it's a little longer, can make it probably easier to see the different parameters, especially when I put even other new lines. Okay, this is obvious. Ask requires three parameters. One is the string, one is this callback function, one is this other callback function. Or I can do it in a different way. Maybe I can create function declaration somewhere else and I can just pass a reference to these functions. So let's try here. I'm going to do the same exact thing. So ask, are you hungry? The second parameter will not be a string then eat and the third parameter exactly the same. So instead of doing then eat, I'm going to create a callback function here. The callback function will say alert then eat. Oops. Okay. And the other callback function will just do exactly the same. Alert then drink. I was pretty fast, but I think you understood what I'm doing. So now I want to show you how you can instead declare these two functions somewhere else. So I'm going to cut, oops, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to cut this name, did this function. I'm going to give it a name. Uh, the name will be on hungry. And I can pass a reference to on hungry instead of uh, defining the function inside of here. And I can do the same with this one. Instead of uh, using this function, I can say on not hungry, I replace it with a reference to a function that I'm going to declare here below, function on not hungry. As you can see, this code now doesn't require that much spacing anymore. I can just remove all these spaces and I can place them neatly like this. This is pretty easy to read. Ask, are you hungry? In case I'm hungry, then I'm going to invoke some function that I declared here below. And in case I'm not hungry, then I'm going to refer to some other function that I declared here below. As you can see, probably he even better, there's no need, and in fact, it's even wrong to apply a couple of parentheses. Because in here, I was just replacing a function declaration or a function expression with the name of a function that I declared somewhere, somewhere else. Let's see if all this works. I'm going to copy all this code. And I'm going to paste it on a fresh page. Did you understand? Yes. Awesome. Are you hungry? No. Then drink. Everything works exactly the same. I refactored my code so it behaves exactly the same as before. So why did I do it? Well, the reason is that now I can completely customize the behavior of my program when I'm... Uh, uh, when I'm... Uh, um, reacting to some answer. So for example, when I'm asking if I understand, if you understand, I can alert things. But maybe if uh, I want to react to the hungerness, hungriness, hung hunger, to the hunger of the user, I don't want to alert, I want to console log, or I want to send an email, or I want to do document writes, or whatever you want to do. So as you can see, you can now customize not only 
the message that you send to the user, but also what you want to do with that message, or even don't send a message at all. Maybe call the FBI or whatever you want. So callback functions allow you the best, the most customizability that you want to. You ask a question and this function doesn't give for granted what it's going to do. It's asking someone else from outside, what do you, how do you want to react to certain answers? Skills for teams. So I cleaned all my house while I was watching you. That's awesome. Awesome. And I cleaned my code while you were watching, while you were cleaning your house. So awesome. It's beautiful to clean things. I love cleaning my code. I don't like cleaning my house in the meantime, but still. Okay. So Right now, I changed my code, so now it alerts when I say, did you understand? But it's going to console log when asking for, hung for hunger. Stay hungry, stay foolish. So, did you understand? Yes, and it's still an alert. But then, are you hungry? Yes, too. And as yes, you can see, the behavior is completely different, is in console log. Skills for team says, actually, I think about refactoring my desk so things will be arranged in a way I could better reach them. That is very, very useful too. Yes, my desk is as, as, as void as possible because I usually need just my computer. But for the sake of these lessons, sometimes I also use props. For example, I introduced to you, if you never saw her before, I introduced to you Miss Quackers which is my rubber duck debugging tool when we try to solve some problem that uh, it's too difficult to just solve right away. So we discuss it with Miss Quackers and by uh, stating the problem, we automatically solve the problem. Okay, I hope that this thing about callback functions is clear. Uh, we will do exercises in, on next Wednesday, as always, so don't worry about that. But as you can see, callback functions are pretty easy to, to, to create. It's just passing a function or a reference to a function to some other function. And this is exactly how it works with event handlers, with event listeners. In fact, you are passing a function or a reference to a function to some other function that you didn't create, it was created by the browser, such as add event listener. Okay, so this is a callback function, which is a function that will be called back sometimes, sometime later, as soon as some event occurs. And I think that's it for, um, for function expressions, because um, I think that I already said everything about this. Yeah, it's a hoisting. They don't, they don't mention hoisting, I think. Maybe it's not called hoisting when it's referred to functions, but it's actually the same thing as hoisting when referred to variables. So you can declare a function after it was invoked because it works, because it's hoisting. And you cannot declare a function expression after you are invoking it because function expressions are not in and are not subject to this hoisting phenomenon that I told you before. Uh, blah, 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 blah. You can invoke functions inside of if else is, of course. And then there's a summary and then, oh, there's no exercise here, but we have exercises, of course. Well, one exercise could be maybe, for example, have a look at the functions that you have declared so far, such as these functions here and maybe try to turn them into function expressions and see how they behave. For example, in uh, where was that? In here, we decided to invoke build empty rectangle, which is defined below and build empty rectangle uses another two functions that are invoked below. So we are going deeper and deeper in the details of how things work by stating the functions from high level to low level. If you try turning these function declarations into function expressions right away, this code will break 
because with function expressions you have to declare functions before using them so in order to make this code work you will probably need to inverse invert the order in which these functions are declared you have to first declare this function then below declare this function, then below declare this function, then below declare this function, and finally you will be able to invoke the higher level function. And now, since we've got time, we're going to do the last part of our fundamentals, which is arrow functions. And arrow functions are even easier than all of this. Are you ready? Do you want to clean your desk skills for Teams before, before joining us? Or should I speak while you clean? Actually, if you are watching the stream while you're cleaning your house and cleaning your desk, this probably means that you like what we are doing and you, you probably even like my voice. <laughs> no, just joking. Um, so, arrow functions. An arrow function is very very similar to a function expression in fact let's first of all create a new file here uh, so where was i 16 new file 03 arrow functions you know how a function expression works you do something like const sum is equal to a function that can be anonymous it usually is anonymous that given A and B will return A plus B. This is a function expression. I'm gonna say it again, function expression, which is pretty similar to a function declaration. Let's rehearse function declaration so we can see how similar they are one to each other. Function sum given A and B returns A plus B. Okay? They are very similar. In order to change from function declaration to function expression, you just need to place this function in here, then create the declaration of the variable, const or let, and then place an equal sign in between, and you're done. Well, as you will see, with arrow functions, you are even closer to function expression. Arrow function means that you declare a variable and you don't say it's a function. You start declaring the parameters and then you write equals greater than, which together look like a fat arrow. And I'm saying fat because there's also the concept of a thin arrow in other languages, not in JavaScript, but in other languages we've got a thin arrow, which is minus greater than. And here we've got a fat arrow because it has an equals. And that's it. Return A plus B. This is exactly the same. So error function is replacing the keyword function before the parameters with a, a fat arrow after the parameters. That's almost what you need to know about the syntax. The syntax can be changed a little bit. For example, this is an error function and it works and it works exactly the same. You can just try it. Uh, we go here and we declare this error function and then we can say sum of two and three will give me five. So everything works the same. Oh, I forgot to put semicolons. Error functions, just like function expressions, are a declaration of a variable. So when you declare a variable, you should probably put a semicolon at the end but the function declaration is not the declaration of a variable in this case the semicolon is not needed it's actually wrong it doesn't do anything at all actually but you shouldn't put it so an arrow function has some uh, cool things that you can do for example if the arrow function like in this case requires just uh, has only one line in the body and the line is about returning stuff then in that case you can write it even more concise because you can completely omit the curly braces and even the return keyword and write the arrow function like this 
If you want to make it more concise, of course, if you don't want to, you can just keep it like this. You cannot do this always. For example, if you are going to um, split this execution in, uh, in, in two pieces, like uh, const the sum, or let's say result, const result is equal to a plus b, and then return results. Uh, of course, this function has exactly the same meaning. Now, the execution, the body of the function has two lines and you cannot turn it into this. But if it has only one line and if that line is returning something, then you can do it like this. You don't even need to put return. In fact, you shouldn't do it because this is not correct syntax. Why should we care about this? Well, for probably two reasons. One is a mathematical reason, because in maths, there is a way to declare functions in this way. We say sum is defined as a function that goes from the domain a, b to the codomain a plus b. This is a formal mathematical definition of a function with a domain that turns into a codomain. But who cares about that? Another reason, more practical, is that well, this is a one-liner. You can write some functions with just one line of code, and they are so nice, they are so concise. For example, let's look at the functions that we declared in function reprise. For example, these ones here, shout, yell, and HTML. If I copy these ones here, not here, <laughs> if I copy these ones here, I can turn them pretty easily into arrow functions like this. Instead of function, I say const shout, and then const shout is equal to str fat arrow, and that's it. I'm going to do the same here. Const yell is equal to, and then I put a fat arrow before the body. And then here, const HTML is equal to, and then fat arrow here. And now I can reason if I can remove those curly braces and this return statement. Well, yes, I can in all three of these functions, because as you can see, these three functions do just one thing and do it well. They just return the results of a computation. So in this case, I can remove the curly braces and I can remove, I have to remove the return statement. And this function became a one liner, which is so nice to see. I can do the same with all three. Remember to remove the return statement. And that's it. I've got three functions that I can even compact them. I have these three functions that behave exactly the same as the previous function declarations, but they are so concise, so nice to see. There's another thing that I can tell you, but it's not that useful anymore. I see that it's not a, a good practice. But for example, shout is a function that takes one parameter in input, unlike the other two, which take two parameters. So if this parameter is the only parameter that we have, and it doesn't have any more decorations, let's say it doesn't have equal um, default string, the default value of the parameter. If it doesn't have anything like that, and it's just a plain parameter, then in that case, only in that case, you can omit the parentheses. But I think that standard JavaScript discourages you to omit the parentheses because there's no use. As soon as you need to place a default, per, a default value, or as soon as you need to add a second parameter, then in that case, you need to add parentheses. So there's no real reason, probably, to omit those parentheses. Uh, yes, you, you have two fewer characters to write, but there's no real advantage in omitting those parentheses. It's much better to have them always, okay? And why should I use the arrow functions? Well, because they look nicer than function expressions. So, uh, yeah, you can use them as one-liners sometimes, or you can use them just as nicer-looking function expressions. 
as Bobby said, you can omit to write all these characters and just replace them with uh, this fat arrow. Uh, I've got, I configured my editor, so it uses a font which is called Fira Code, and this font allows for ligatures. And ligatures are so nice because Okay, thanks. Uh, ligatures, if I enable them, allow me to see a combination of characters as if they were one single character. Look at that. The equal and greater than symbol has become one symbol that looks like a fat arrow, just like the minus greater than looks like a single arrow, like a thin arrow. So this is something for you guys if you like uh, nice looking code, you can install a font called uh, Fira Code or something similar to that and you can enable font ligatures. This guy is called, or a girl, is called MMYH, which I is probably don't know how to pronounce, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I guess the best teacher I've ever had in my life. Listen to what he says, guys. It's worth every second. Are you talking about me? <laughs> Well, if that's the case, really thanks a lot. Guy from Formarete. Oh, okay. <laughs> you are one of my former students. Who are you? Uh, you probably already told me who you are. So you are one of those who already uh, witnessed the importance of uh, good teaching. Uh, who are you? Please tell me. So yeah, thanks, thanks for the advertising. <laughs> Simone! Simone Papagni! Ah, <laughs> Simone! That's so nice to see you here. I don't think you need any of this nowadays. But uh, feel free to stay here with us. Uh, it's nice to see you here and, and interacting with us. Okay, so arrow functions are... don't know, I, I mean, it doesn't hurt. Yeah, I saw other people wanted to, uh, other former students wanted to stick in and, uh, and see. Because sometimes I also go a little more in detail than what I did in previous editions of the course. Well, my lessons are always trying to become better and better. So usually, yeah, every new edition is probably better than the other, hopefully. So, arrow functions are pretty cool. But it's not the only thing that you can do with an arrow function. Angelo, but you cannot just do the following, right? Sum A of B equal to return A, B. Yes, you can. So you're saying const sum is equal to given A and B, you are going to open brackets and return A plus B in one single line. Yes, you can. You can. Uh, it doesn't mean that you should. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, the only thing is that, well, with this kind of function, you can even remove the curly braces and the return, and it will be a little more concise. But yeah, you can write any function, actually, with just one line of code. You can do function sum given a and b is equal to return a plus b. You can do it with um, the function expression. Count sum is equal to function that takes a and b and returns a plus b. But, I don't know you, the presence of this return, and especially the presence of these curly braces, adds a lot of noise to my usual reading. If I want to put things on one line, I prefer to have them cleaner. So this looks a little cleaner than just having return A plus B in curly braces. Uh, so just rewriting a plain function with arrows, I mean without the const. I'm sorry, I didn't understand this one. Uh, wait a second, but you have something slightly different. You said sum of A and B is return A plus B. So you wrote exactly this. I don't know if you intended this, if you meant this, but if you meant this, then thanks a lot for this, because no, this is wrong. And I, I don't want to... Uh, to, 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 and I want you to feel ashamed of being wrong. In fact, uh, we already discussed about this. It's really, really important to discuss on what you can and what you cannot do. So this is a perfect example of one of the things that look good to you, but maybe, uh, but they are not, they are wrong and you should 
um, probably learn, see the shape of it and uh, start uh, getting accustomed to the fact that this shape has something wrong in it. So what is wrong with this thing? Well, sum of A and B is not declared. You have to declare things. And in order to declare things, you have to use some keyword. For example, if you want to declare a function, you have to write function here. Otherwise, you are not declaring the, the function properly. Or you can declare it as a variable. And then you have to add const or let in order to declare it as a variable. And in that case, as you already saw from here, you also need to add an equals. Because when you declare a variable, that variable has a name and it should be assigned some value. So it must have this equal symbol to declare not only the name, but also what its value. Okay, so sum of A and B like this, unfortunately, doesn't work. And it doesn't even work if you remove those returns statements there. It just works if you do const sum is equal to or if you do function sum, and in that case, you cannot use an arrow. You have to just return things as you already know. Okay, I hope that I answered your question. I'm not sure that I, that I got you. That's what I meant. Thanks for clarifying. Awesome. And thank you for this, uh, uh, for this objection, for this doubt. Uh, please, guys, tell me uh, anything, because everything that you say is really, really valuable. Any feedback is appreciated. Okay, so there is also another advantage with uh, arrow functions, but we are not able right now to understand this. And we are not able to understand the value of arrow functions because we never stumbled upon this keyword called this. It's called this, and it's a keyword. And uh, we can say arrow functions will be useful when dealing with this. What is this? I'm not going to tell you. Not right now. Because you have to know objects before understanding this. So, not going to tell you. So, arrow functions, the basics. Uh, we just declare it as a function expression, but instead of declaring function here, we replace the function before the parameters with a fat arrow after the parameters. And that's it. It's very, very similar. It's, it looks like a shorter version of the function expression. It behaves exactly the same as a function expression. And just like a function expression, you have to declare it before using it. So if you try to do something like um, let result is equal to hello, Result is equal to shout of result. Result is equal to yell the result. And finally, result is equal to HTML of the result. And then you console log. Uh, I'm writing just the same exact stuff that we wrote before when looking at these functions. Well, all this stuff will not work unless I declare all these arrow functions before invoking them. So this will not work because I have to place these functions before invoking them. Just like with function expressions, arrow functions for now look like a cleaner, nicer, fancier way to create function expressions. So they are subject exactly to the same limitations as function expressions. They have to be declared before invoking them Otherwise, they won't work because they are not subject to hoisting. Mm, what else? What else? What else? As you can see, sometimes it's uh, really convenient to use function uh, arrow functions because they are so concise. Let's see what happens with the ask thing here. So let me just copy all of this thing and I'll try to refactor it using arrow functions okay so this is the code that we had starting from here from ask ask did you understand well this function is doing one thing 
and one thing only it's not even returning alerts but i don't care it can return alert and then not do anything with that alert so i can turn this anonymous function into an anonymous arrow function and since it's doing one thing i can even put everything in one line like this and these are the two I can remove the function keyword, I can add a fat arrow, I can remove all the curly braces, and this is what I get. So it's a little more concise, it's a little more readable. Ask requires three parameters, one is the string, the second one is an arrow function, a callback, the second one, same. You can still invoke things like this, so you just need to invoke uh, these functions and if you want them to become arrow functions you can you do const on hungry is equal to fat arrow and since we still have only one line of code we can remove the curly braces even if we are not returning anything we don't care and the same goes with not on, on not hungry so I'm removing everything that's optional from here now that we've got, oh, I forgot the fat arrow. And now that we've got these two, I have to remember, however, to place them before invoking the ask function. Otherwise, they will not work. I will have a complaint from the browser uh, because of uh, a function that was invoked before being declared. Now this should work. Let's do this with uh, the function ask. So this is const ask is equal to a narrow function that takes these three parameters and does all this stuff. And since there's a lot of code involved here, I cannot do the trick of removing the curly braces, etc, etc. I have to keep it like this. And since I'm asking here, I cannot declare ask after invoking it, so I have to place ask right after. Okay, and well, this goes to uh, ask is declared, is invoked before it's declared, so I should probably declare this function on top. Okay, let's read this code again. I'm declaring a function called ask with three parameters, and it's an arrow function. Since it's an arrow function, since it's similar to a uh, function expression, I'm going to place it on top of my whole execution and then I will be able to invoke it. The first time I'm invoking it with three parameters, two of which are callback functions which I'm declaring on the spot as arrow functions. And then we've got another couple of functions that I wanted to declare as arrow functions, but this time I store those arrow functions in variables that I can then pass to my ask function. And all this should just work exactly like before. Did you understand? No. I will repeat it once more. But are you hungry? Yes. And then eat. So everything works exactly the same as before by just turning function declarations into arrow functions and mining to change the order of these functions so they will not give me an error. The problem that we have with arrow functions is that we cannot do what I already told you, which is writing our code and reading our code as if it was a newspaper article. Let me check if there's any reference about this. Uh, code newspaper article. Mm, not pro probably not. Oh, come on. Uh, programming. Nope, cannot find it. But it's all about clean code. I'm giving you some uh, hints on how to read clean code. And as I already told you, clean code is not just uh, two words. It's uh, actually a uh, best practice that was... Uh, I don't know if invented or promoted by Uncle Bob, Robert Martin, a famous software engineer who created this beautiful book that I encourage you to read because it's beautiful. I do not encourage you to read it right now because it involves some other things that we have to cover in this course. But after 
we write we we cover all the aspects of the code then please read this book because it's awesome it's eye-opening i think and in this book they also tell you something about uh, writing and reading code as a newspaper article which means that as we saw last time we can do something like where was that functional shapes we can read our code as do this okay but what does it mean to do this well do that okay but what does it mean to do exactly this piece of that okay we have to go down below and down below so it looks like a heading a subheading and then also some other paragraphs that explain the news in more detail the more you scroll down and with arrow functions you cannot do this because in arrow functions every support function must be declared before invoking it so you cannot write your code as newspaper article that's why my best practice to you is whenever you're creating functions that are high level that are uh, written in your file in your module in your code I would still encourage you to use function declarations because you can benefit from the newspaper article model and when you do callbacks when you have smaller support functions uh, like these ones then you can write them as arrow functions and in general there's no real need to use function expressions anymore I never saw any good use of function expression other than certain specific scenarios that deal with the, this keyword that I still have to show you so I'm not going to show it to you and that's it for the fundamentals guys we got it we, we we spent quite a while because it's fundamentals we started from lesson 10 so 10 there was 11 but I cannot find it here 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 so seven lessons on the fundamentals why is that because they are fundamental now we're going to look at things that are equally fundamental but sometimes they are more um specific to javascript well well some of these things are specific to javascript for example arrow functions uh, they have a similar thing in java for example or probably also in c sharp they have a different name in Java you can create something like this which is specifically for callback functions and in Java it is called a lambda and I don't know in C sharp actually but it's slightly different it's a slightly different way of dealing with functions uh, Java is not a functional language and they try to incorporate some functional constructs some constructs from functional languages in Java but still it's a very strict language based on classes there are some other languages based on java for example scala or kotlin that are more functional javascript is functional per se so we can just uh, use all these functional features practice time uh, we did everything <laughs> we did everything that was meant to be done here so the practice that i asked you to do is as always do all the exercises do all the tasks that you see here in the material and then perform some other exercises like rewriting with arrow functions the functions that you already have created before or experiment with new functions i will try to come up with some other exercises next wednesday maybe um, but in the meantime we can probably go forward because i don't think that this was too much for you guys so we can go on with the next set of slides is it not are you still there with me? Can you spend the rest, the, the this rest of uh, forty-five minutes that's left for us in um, in doing some of some other things? You know what? Before objects, we can go with code quality, and uh, yes, all's fine, awesome. So let's go with code quality, which is probably pretty stupid, but I'm going to add some more stuff to it so it will not be as stupid so there was a, a whole slide deck about code quality because this slide deck reflects exactly what you have in the javascript info tutorial so it shows you how to debug in chrome 
which we already know, so I'm going to skip this part, but now you've got some reference material. You can, as I already done today, you can add breakpoints, and when you refresh the page, uh, the execution will stop at those breakpoints. And at this point, you can uh, continue the execution or step over, step in, step outside. Well, now that we've got functions, you can finally see what it means to step in and step out. So I'm going to do this. Let's go to... Let's go to this file again. So I'm going to open it again. And in the sources, I'm going to put a breakpoint in here. I don't know if it works. I'm going to click. It says clicked and nothing is happening. So no. Uh, oh yeah, because I was hovering. Wait a second, button click. Let's do... Ah, maybe this is not enough. Okay, let's do another experiment. I'm going to comment out all of this. Not like this. Ah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm going to comment out all this code in a JavaScript way, which is, seems to be not working in here. If you see, it's going to comment in the HTML way, which is not what I wanted. So, you know what? I'm going to create a function here. Um, I'm going to call it test event handlers and this function is going to wrap all of the code that we've done so far so as always this is the trick with which I can mute all the code that we've done by putting it inside of a function and never invoke this function now I'm going to create a function called outer and this function is going to print something in the console it's going to say before and then it's also going to print after why before and after because in between i also want to call another function called in so as you can imagine this console log will be uh, executed before executing the inner function and this after will be executed after the inner function was executed. So now I also need to declare a function called inner. And this will just say inner. And that's it. Now I can just invoke the outer function and see what happens. I'm going to stop here for a while just to give you the time to read everything and maybe even copy so i'm invoking an outer function the outer function is declared here below and it's the result of console logging before then invoking some inner function <laughs> sorry and then uh, doing another console log afterwards and the inner function is just going to do console log inner that's it these are two functions one inside of the other I said Russian doll before, but probably I was inappropriate. Russian doll. Okay, it was not what I int Oh yeah, it's uh, I, I know it as Matrioska, which is probably the Russian name. Matrioska. Yeah. <laughs> or uh, if you want, it's an onion. Okay, <laughs> so it's like Shrek. It's an onion. It's an onion of functions. Okay, let's refresh. And now the event handlers will not work because I muted them by wrapping them inside of a function that will never be executed. But outer and inner should actually be executed. In fact, we see before, inner and after, which is exactly what we expected. But now we can do something like, let's debug from here. So I'm adding a breakpoint and I'm refreshing the browser. So there's no console log being performed yet. When I do outer, when I step over the function call, it's going to go to the end of the file and now the console log already logged everything. So not really useful now. But now if I refresh the browser, I can also do another thing. I can step 
into the function call. When I step into the function call, it's just like I'm unwrapping the function and getting inside of its eternal details. And as you can see, in fact, when I step into the function call, I'm now inside of the outer function. And then if I step into this console log, it's not going to do anything because console log is a function. But since it's a, um, a browser function, it's a ready-made function that the browser does not want me to see, to look inside, when I step into, this gives exactly the same result as stepping over. So right now, the console log should have printer, should have printed before. Awesome. Then if I want to inspect what is in, inside of inner, I can still step into the function call. And just like I step into a function, I can also step out. So with this button here, I'm stepping out of inner and now I'm back again in the outer function. So I can now step over or into or out, whatever I want. And finally, outer is finished. So if I continue stepping over, I will see that I will be exactly where I expected outside after the outer function was called. So finally, with the use of functions, we know what these other two buttons are about. Step into, step out. You can get inside of the internal details of a function or get outside of that function if you really care about it. For example, let's say that you know what inner does and you don't want to step inside of inner. So you just debug from outer, you step into outer, and you step over console log. You don't care to go inside of inner, so you step over and then you step over and that's it, you finish. But in the meantime, you can inspect what is happening inside of every function. Okay, so some advanced tools that you can now use in the Chrome debug, the, the debugger. Uh, there is also a Visual Studio Code debugger, but I had many problems in making it to work and, me, and allowing you guys to work uh, with the debugger in Visual Studio Code. I had a private session with uh, Katri, who's following us, but uh, not live, because she cannot, but she's still following us, so hi Katri! And she had problems debugging some uh, HTML code. And I totally understand it. Uh, I think that Visual Studio Code is still a little buggy with this. There are some occasions in which we start debugging the code and it opens a server on port 8080, which doesn't exist. Sometimes instead it opens the file as if it was a file and everything works. But the node debugger works pretty well. And... Um, if you want to use it, uh, just be aware that you cannot use alert or prompt or anything that is browser specific on the node debugger. So probably the best thing to do is just to use the Chrome debugger as we are doing right now. Um, not going to go too much in detail about debugging. Uh, sometimes you're so lazy that you don't want to debug, so you use the console log. Console log is actually used by developers to inspect what is the current value of things without the user noticing it. Of course, uh, you don't want people to see before, inner and after. These are usually debug statements, debug words that you put in order to see if uh, the function looped where you want it. For example, in this case, uh, you are instead of debugging, you're just doing console log in order to see what the value of uh, i is at every iteration but usually it is much better to use the debugger rather than placing console logs scattered everywhere in your code note that there is also another thing that you should know about the debugger there's a special keyword that you can add to your code it's called debugger and you can place it to place some some sort of breakpoint uh, wherever whenever you want to stop the execution let's try it uh, I'm going to put it here, for example, before even invoking the inner function. Let's see what happens. Okay, I'm setting debugger. And if things go well, even without having any breakpoints in the code, the debugger will stop there. Yes, it does. So it's a way to control exactly from the JavaScript code where you want to pause execution. 
The problem with this is that if you don't remember to remove the debugger keyword when you then publish your code in production, your code will stop working, will interrupt its work at this point. So it's not really, it's really, really dangerous. So please don't use debugger without knowing what you're doing. Uh, tracing the execution, blah, blah, blah. This is something that I really encourage you to look at by yourself. So it's not really that important. Coding style. Okay, as the, as the tutorial says, and I said already multiple times, our code must be as clean and easy to read as possible. That is actually the art of programming, to take a complex task and code it in a way that is both correct and also human readable. A good code style greatly assists in that. So there are some rules that we have to follow, and we already followed them. And today, if I have the time, I will show you how to forget about these rules because there are tools that will allow you to write in correct style automatically. So, according to syntax, for example, in between parameters of a function, you should place a space. Uh, the indentation should be usually two spaces, some prefer four spaces, some prefer tabs instead of spaces, it's not really that important. The curly brace in C is usually on a new line, but in other languages such as Java or JavaScript, it's usually on the same line, separated by a space, which is actually what we are doing right now. Uh, we usually put semicolon. This says it's mandatory, but no, that's not really, really true. It's actually optional. Uh, there should be a space after the for or the if, else, and there should be a space in between statements. There should be new lines to tell apart different logical blocks, and we already did this. We used new lines to separate pieces like gather the input, then perform the calculations. They are separate uh, concerns that we separate with a new line. Uh, lines should never be long. In fact, they should probably be uh, 80 characters or even less, maybe even 72 characters long. I think that the default is 80 character maximum. If it goes beyond the 80 characters, then you will have to scroll sideways to read all of your code, which is really, really annoying. So please, Whenever you can, try to stick in the 80 characters. And if you cannot, just go to a new line sometimes. You can. In fact, with template literals, you can have a long string and place it on a new line. And when you do a nested call, this guy is suggesting you to put spaces. I never do this. I understand that it could be more readable, but I don't do it. You see also the else block doesn't have line breaks. I saw some of you doing it. For, probably it was um, Sao who added some line breaks to make things more clear. And it's fine. If that's your standard, you can keep it. But the standard JavaScript usually doesn't put those new lines. So it depends on uh, how compliant you want to be with uh, the standard uh, syntax of JavaScript or with the standard that was agreed by the rest of your team. Uh, curly braces, just put curly braces everywhere. You can omit curly braces when uh, you have only one line of code in an if condition, but I would say it's much better not to do it. So blah, blah, blah. Okay, <laughs> I don't want to go too much in detail on that, but yeah, beginners sometimes do that. You put curly braces and the alert in the same line. But uh, this is another thing. You put it in a separate line, but with no curly braces. This is fine. You can put things on the same line without curly braces. But as you can see, the emoji here is the happiest when you have the body of the if statement both on a new line and with curly braces. Don't just be a smart ass and do something that is not agreeing to the standard. Line length, we already saw. Indenting, it's usually two or four spaces or tabs. There is a nice, yeah, there is a nice meme about that. You remember the old commercial about PC and Mac. This is has become a, a commercial about tabs and spaces. And then there's this guy, both, and he's being beaten up. Um, 
this is not relevant anymore because usually the editor takes care of applying spaces or tabs uh, under the hood. In fact, you can see here below, it says spaces for. So indentation right now is using four spaces. I didn't select it, it's by default, but you can change it. You can indent everything using spaces, you can indent using two spaces or indent everything using tabs. It's not really that important anymore because uh, there are tools that will convert automatically from your tabs to the team's spaces or vice versa. Um, vertical indents, okay, we know that we should put some uh, new lines where appropriate and we are doing it. Semicolons, they should be present after each statement, even if I really, really don't care about it. If you're an experienced JavaScript programmer, you may choose a no semicolon code like standard JS, which is my way of writing code. This is one of the standards and it's called standard, so probably uh, it's, a, it's a standard. But uh, yeah, there are people who prefer to use semicolons, there's people who don't. Uh, when I work by myself, I don't use semicolons. But right now I'm working for a client that prefers to use semicolons, so I use semicolons. And that's fine. Uh, function placement, we already know about this. As you know, you can declare the functions above before using those functions. But there's also this other style in which the helper functions are declared below. And this is probably better for the reasons that I already told you. Uh, style guides, there are so many style guides. We saw standard, but there's also a standard by Google, which is not that famous actually. The most famous standards, I think they are standard JS and also Airbnb. Airbnb at a certain point became the de facto standard for JavaScript code. So as you can see, there are lots of companies out there which have nothing to do about programming, but probably they have strong development teams which are now providing us the tools and the standard that everybody wants to use. Facebook gives us React, Google gives us Angular, and Airbnb gives us a standard way of writing JavaScript code. All these standards can be forced with some tools that apply these standards automatically, or maybe they warn you if you are not uh, applying the standard correctly. And these tools are usually called linters. We can add an ESLint and we can add a prettier tool that we, I don't see here. So first of all, let's add prettier. Prettier is a tool that we can easily add on Visual Studio Code. It's an extension. So you can go here to this button, which is all about extensions, and you can look for prettier, which, as you can imagine, makes our code prettier. So the first result should be the right one, prettier code for matter. I already have it installed, so please, you install it if you don't have it installed, and enable it if you have it disabled. The Prettier extension comes with its own executable, with its own Prettier program. So I think that you don't need anything more than this right now. Once you installed this extension, you can go back to your JavaScript code, whatever JavaScript code. You know what? I'm going to create a new JavaScript code here. New file. Um, Wait a second, new folder, code quality. This is our second topic. I'm, I'm just going to refactor my, my structure, waiting for you to install the Prettier extension, okay? Since I have time, why not? Okay, I prefer it better like this. And then I'm in the code quality, I'm going to create a new file. Uh, I don't know. Um, make me pretty.js. Make me pretty.js is a file in which I'm going to write the ugliest code that I can imagine. So, for example, we can do something like the shout, yell, and uh, stuff. 
uh, but I don't want to rewrite everything from scratch, otherwise it will take too much. So I'm going to just copy some of this code here. This is pretty difficult to make ugly, but uh, we can probably, for example, remove uh, all the spaces, remove the spaces between parameters. We can remove the semicolons, which are optional, but are recommended. And we can put this parameter on a new line for some reason, which is kind of ugly. And of course, we cannot remove a, the space between the const and the variable name. Otherwise, this is not um, interpreted as a variable declaration. Uh, we can go to a new line here too. Maybe also multiple tabs. Okay, I'm just going to mess up as much as I can with my code. There's not much to do here, but I'm trying to, to, to make it as ugly as possible. You are better than me at, at this task. Hello, living legend. Hey, Club Spinach. So good to see you here. You, you didn't answer to my last question last time. I asked you, who are you? You are my former student, but I couldn't uh, understand which former student you are. There's uh, Simone who, who explicitly said he is Simone. But who are you? I'm pretty sure I remember you if you give me your name, but I cannot recognize you as Club Spinach only. So please, please tell me who you are. It would be nice to give a face <laughs> to Club Spinach. Otherwise, I'm just going to imagine you as a sandwich. Okay, so this code is as ugly as possible. And now I want to format it with Prettier. I think I can do it with this. So with the Control Shift P or Command Shift P on Mac, with this combination of keys, I'm going to open the command palette. And in here, I can probably start typing prettier. And prettier is ask, it just has pre create configuration file, which is not what I wanted. So let's just not mention prettier. And uh, maybe it's uh, format. Okay, there is a format document. There is also a format document with. I'm going to try format document as it is, which has a combination of keys in my case, which is control shift I, but I don't care about that. So I'm going to format the document by pressing enter. Ooh, look at that. The document was formatted automatically by Prettier. You should see a Prettier here below. If it asks you for something, sometimes Prettier asks, uh, sometimes Visual Studio Code asks you what tool you want to use in order to format the document, just choose Prettier and that's it. I was one of the first people who started learning from you on Twitch months ago. Oh, okay, so you're not one of my former students. You are still one Twitch student. Awesome, okay, so welcome back. Didn't see you for uh, some time and uh, thanks a lot for your enthusiasm as always. So as you can see, the code is already formatted. So why didn't we install Prettier earlier? Because I wanted you guys to force and write good code and not to spoil you too much. Could you repeat again the Prettier thing? I was still messing up the code. Yes, yeah, sure. So I'm messing up the code too. And now I'm going to Control Shift P or Command Shift P, which opens the command palette. The command palette is the palette in which you can issue any command that Visual Studio Code recognize, recognizes. And among these, there should be something like called format something. So I'm going to start typing format. And there is actually a format document. Format document is what we want. So I'm clicking here. And if Preacher is the only tool, formatting tool available, it shouldn't ask you anything at all. It should just format the document automatically. And then you also need to save it. Kleb Spinach says, I'm your online student. I would love to be your former student, but I'm from another nation. What about that? You are my student right now, if you want to. And once this course is finished, you will be my former student. <laughs> and that's it. Um, I had to do some uh, 
lessons to my students online. Uh, it's not the same thing as being live, uh, well, in person. But I think that Simone was still a former student that I could see live. But there are some students out there, especially from, from the last edition in Italy, that I, I couldn't see them live, never. Uh, we did the lessons on Zoom, and then we met physically for the first time at a dinner after the course finished. But yeah, due to coronavirus, uh, it's very, very difficult to have uh, live, physical live lessons. But still, you can be my student, I can be your teacher if you welcome me. Here I am for you. Okay, is everything fine, Angelo? Did you see? And uh, does formatting, automatically formatting works? If formatting works... <coughs> okay, Angelo, is it correct though that the code itself has to be 100% accurate to be able to be printed up? So pretty will not correct for missing brackets or else, right? Yes, you're, you're completely right. I didn't show this to you. So let's do something that... Yes, thanks, could follow now. Yes, oh, so Angelo said a very important thing. If your code is not correct, if your code has errors, then in that case, Preacher will not work. This code is never going to be prettified. Prettify me. <laughs> okay. This code is not going to be prettified, it's not going to be formatted, because the if needs a condition. So if I try now to format the document, it's not doing anything. Okay? If instead I say, I say if true, well, this is valid code, and if I want to format code, maybe I can try with Control shift i That's it. Now the code is formatted. If you don't want to format every single time, if you don't want to issue this command every single time, there is an option in Visual Studio Code that you can enable. Let's enable it together. So, you do command comma or control comma for non-Mac users. I'm a Windows, well, I'm a Linux user, so I have to use control comma. Control comma is opening the settings of Visual Studio Code. In the settings, you can search for settings. Control comma opens the settings and now with this text field you can filter the possible settings. The filter that I'm looking for, the setting that I'm looking for, is called something like format on save. If I write format on save I will have fewer settings to look at but the first one is the one that I want. Editor format on save. If I click on this checkbox, now every single time I save a file, if the file is correct, then Prettia will automatically format it for me. Pretty, pretty convenient. So in settings, you search for format on save, and then the first option should be something like editor, colon, format and save, and you can check the checkbox. A formatter must be available, so if you haven't installed Prettier, this will not work. The file must not be saved after some delay, and I don't care about that, and the editor must not be shutting down. Okay, so, this file will be formatted automatically. And uh, you know that there's also a, a JSON representation of this configuration, you can find it here if you want to. Editor, format and save is true. Is ex exactly the same, you don't care about that. You can find it here in the graphical interface. Okay, so now I can just save the file and it's formatted automatically. How cool is that? Now you can be spoiled. Now you can write ugly code as long as it works and the code will be automatically formatted. But I really, really encourage you to still try as much as you can to write good code following good conventions instead of uh, relying too much on the automatic formatter. If I was good enough, just saving this file should not change too much. It changes a few things. Let's see what does it change. Look at this. One, two, three, bam. So the only thing that I see changing is one, the single quotes were all turned into double quotes. And the second thing that I saw is that the indentation was four spaces and it became two spaces. 
Why is that? Because Prettier, as a formatting tool, has some default configurations which apparently uh, comprise the single double quotes instead of single quotes and an indentation of two spaces instead of four spaces. But if you don't like this kind of standard, you can change it. And you can change it by creating a small file. You usually create this file at the root of your project, but I'm going to create it here inside of this folder. This file can be written in multiple ways, but I really, really encourage you to write it in this format. The file has a strange name. It's called dot because it's a hidden file. So you know that in Linux and on the terminal, hidden files always start with a dot. Then you say prettier, which is the name of our tool. And then you also say RC, which means that there are two R's, not just one. Prettier RC, two R's, not prettiers, but prettier RC. And as you can see, the icon next to Prettier RC already changed into something. But one other thing that I would like to do is to add an extension. An extension of this file is .yml. So the name is .prettier RC with no spaces, no dashes, no camel case. Prettier RC, all lowercase. And watch out because it has to have two R's in the name. Dot YML. YML is the usual extension that we use for YAML files. And YAML is an acronym that stands for yet another markup language. And YAML is a very nice uh, syntax that we can use to create configuration files. Because configuration files, as you will see, are easily created by stating key colon value key colon value key colon value it does a lot more than that but for now we can just keep to that so dot prettier rc dot yml and in this file we can override the default configurations that are applied by prettier for example single quote in camel case column true. This is a configuration, single quote, that is provided by Prettier, and by default it's false. If it's false, it means that Prettier by default will use, will use double quotes for strings. But if I say single quote true, then in that case, Prettier will, will override this default configuration and will try to apply single quotes instead of double quotes whenever possible. So after this, if I go back to my file and try to save it again, if everything works, doesn't work. <laughs> okay, probably doesn't work because this file should be at the root of our project and it cannot stay in the folder code quote quality. I'm pretty sure that's the problem. So I'm going to move this file just by dragging and dropping at the root, which in my case is in Glorious Portfolio. Do you really want to move it? Yes. So in Inglorious Portfolio, I have all these folders. And then after all these folders, I should also have this prettier RCYML. Maybe in that case, it will work. Let's see. Control S. I'm saving the file. Yes, the quotes became single quotes. Another rule that I usually add for myself is because I don't like semicolons. So in prettier rc i also say semi false semi false is going to remove all the semicolons so if i go back to my file and i save it all the semicolons are stripped away and if i want them back again i can just say semi true or i can just remove the option and the semicolons will be back again there okay so preacher has some defaults you can override these defaults by putting them in this file called .prettierrc.yml, which apparently should be at the root of your project. Angelo, is there a way to make comments in the mm file? Yes, there is. You can write comments in this. Thanks for the question. And the comments in this particular file 
are start with a hash symbol. So this config replaces double quotes with single quotes. And if I say that this is false, this config replaces, well, removes all semicolons. Thanks for the question. Yes, one reason why I prefer pre uh, YAML as a format for configuration files, other than other formats such as JSON, which is a very famous format, it's actually more famous than YAML, it's that JSON doesn't allow for comments while YAML does. You just need to know how to do those. Uh, comments in this case are with hashtags. Well, hashtags, hash, pound, symbol. I don't know how to call it. Okay, and how do I know these, these keys and the values that I can provide? Well, well, this is for my, for, from experience, of course, but if I don't have experience, I'll look on the internet. Prettier configuration. And you will see that Prettier has different options. And the options are all listed here in the Prettier documentation. There's an option which is print width. Print width by default is 80, which means that Prettier will automatically put your code on a new line if your line is exceeding the, 80, the limit of 80 characters. The tab width is two spaces by default, or, well, yeah, two spaces. The tabs is false, so in the, uh, in the fight between, in the war between tabs and spaces, Prettier says we want to use spaces instead of tabs. Okay, that's fine with me, but if you want to use tabs, just put tabs to false, uh, use tabs to true, and they will become tabs. Semicolons, we already used it. You can use semi and then a Boolean value, true or false. Quotes, we already know, single quote, which can be true or false. There's also other, uh, lots of other properties. Trailing commas, bracket spacing, Things about JSX, which is strictly related to Facebook's React um, framework. Um, arrow function, for example, by default, you know that you can remove the parentheses to an arrow function if there is just one parameter. But by default, um, Prettier prefers to always put parentheses. But if you want to remove them, you can do, you can place arrow parents equals to avoid, which will remove those parentheses in those particular cases. Bobby, how do you use the CLI overrides for the file? This one here, well, um, if you want to use Prettier from the command line interface, you should have Prettier available on the terminal, which we don't. We don't have Prettier available. Usually we say Prettier as a command, and then you can provide the the overrides on the CLI, for example, dash dash arrow parens equals to avoid. And you do, and you, um, and you execute Prettier on some file. For example, here we are here, so we can say, apply this thing on code quality, make me pretty. The problem is that we don't have this executable. We didn't need to install this executable because when we installed the Visual Studio extension for Prettier, this extension already shipped with its own uh, executable, with its own Prettier executable, which is probably pretty difficult to access from here. So we usually don't do this. Um, but with ESLint, which is another tool that I want to show you, and we don't have time today, so I will show you to next Saturday. But next Saturday, we will use ESLint, and you will see that we will have to install this executable. So we will use overrides also from the command line if we really want to. We really don't want to. So we've got multiple options here. You just need to look at all the options and find the one that you prefer to override if you want to. Otherwise, you can just stick with the default options. I usually, in my code, I usually do this behavior. 
But in my client's code, for example, my, clients has, my client has nothing wrong with using single quotes instead of double quotes, but the client prefers semicolon. So I'm going to stick with semi-true. Or I can just comment out this option and this will stick with the default. Okay? And I think that we can stop here for today. Remember to still write good code. And if you see my code, it usually doesn't change that much when I save it because it's already good code. And if you rely too much on uh, tools, you will probably become a pretty bad programmer. And as soon as those tools are not available for some reason, you will get quite stuck. So it's much better. That's why I wanted to show you these tools only at the end of the fundamentals. Next time, we will also look a little, well, we'll know about comments and we know about Ninja code. Uh, there are some really funny things that you can read here. About comments, you probably know everything about comments and we can tell this next time, but I'm pretty sure that you know everything. I already told you everything that's worth saying about comments. So you can read this by yourselves too. And about Ninja Code, this is a very funny, um, a very funny page in the tutorial that is, of course, very, very ironic. So read everything. And at the end of everything, you will say not. So this is all completely ironic so it, it says you should create ugly code as this one because this will make you show how smart you are and this is actually be ta to be taken exactly on the opposite so have a read to this section called ninja code which is very very funny angelo update a new year's resolution try to code so well that prettier becomes obsolete lol Yes, yes, this is exactly what you want to do. Exactly. You try to write the best code that you can, and then the tool will help you make it better. But it should be good from the start. Please, please try and do it uh, and make code as good as possible from the start. As practice time for this section, we just have refactor any code you wrote so far by improving code quality. Okay. Add ESLint and Pre-Tier extension to VS Code. We already added Pre-Tier. We didn't add ESLint. And if you try to add the ESLint extension, which you can find pretty easily here, it will not work out of the box. There is a reason. And the reason is that you have to also install the executable because this extension, for some reason, doesn't ship its own executable. So it will be tried kind of difficult for you to install ESLint if you don't know how to install the ESLint executable. We can do this next Saturday, don't worry about that. Elaborate more on clean code, which means, oh yeah, I put a reference to this set of slides by Arturo Herrero, and these slides summarize the book by Robert Martin on clean code. Probably this is way too much, but uh, maybe you can find something on Wikipedia. There is something about clean code on Wikipedia. The German version, for some reason. <laughs> okay, I don't read German, but uh, Angelo does. So you can write something uh, here about clean code. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's this guy here, Robert Martin. Anyway, clean code is really, really important because every fool can write a program that a machine is able to understand but only a few lucky people are able to write code that a human can understand. And this is exactly what we are doing in the Inglorious Academy. It's not just a coding academy. It's an Inglorious Academy. I'm giving you some superpowers that other people out there do not have. And this is a once-in-a-lifetime occasion, I think. Especially if this is my last edition of this course. But I really hope that I will do more and more editions in the following years. If I see that this thing goes well and if I receive positive feedback from you guys and that's it for today so please practice see you next wednesday evening for some practice together and in the meantime as always eat pasta code faster bye